three, two, one. Okay. I'd like to call this meeting to order and welcome you to another all candidates meeting. Tonight, we are providing access via Zoom and live streaming it on YouTube. To view it later, it can be accessed on the Parkgate YouTube channel, and I understand it'll be available by tomorrow evening. Only those here this evening will have the opportunity to ask questions of the candidates. I'm Lorraine Harvey, Chair of the Seymour Community Association, and I'm pleased to be your moderator this evening. Before we begin, may I ask everyone to please mute your, mute your cell phones if you have not already done so. We'd really appreciate it. This meeting is being hosted by the Community Associations of Blue Ridge, Deep Cove, and Seymour, as well as the Parkgate Society. Our thanks to Dale Cheney, who's just over here, and he's going to be uh, providing the assistance tonight in recording the event. We also thank Mount Seymour United Church for the use of their space this evening. I would like to introduce members of the organizing committee. Representing Blue Ridge is Eric Anderson. The Deep Cove Community Association is represented by Catherine Fagerlin and Chris Salas. And representing the Seymour Community Association, uh, uh, Adele is here, she's part of our group, Greg Lindsay on the timer, myself, Lorraine Harvey, and have uh, Karen Barnett, here we go. Christine Miller is also a member of Blue Ridge and the, and the Seymour Association, and she's busy handing out cards tonight too. We are also grateful to Adele Wilson uh, for, of Parkgate for her being our collector of questions and general assistant of all things. Candidates chose their position on stage by way of a draw, except for the mayors, which I made a management decision. <laughs> and together, the council are all together and then the mayors are in the front, so you can see that. The format of the meeting has been explained to the candidates, but for the benefit of you, I will outline it briefly. We will start by asking the same question of all candidates, which they have already received, and they will have two minutes to answer. At the end of the meeting, they will have one minute to make their closing statements. After the candidates have answered the first question, we have some prepared questions which will be asked of each candidate, and they will have one minute to answer. Then we will get to your questions, which and on which they will have one min minute to answer. Questions directed to no particular candidate will be asked of the candidates in the order that they are seated. And we, it is our intent to be as fair as possible in terms of asking an equal number of questions to each candidate, but understandably, if many questions are asked of one or two individuals, that may not be possible. All comments are timed. Our timer will turn on the yellow light, indicating 15 seconds remaining in their time. Once the red light goes on, candidates will have five seconds to conclude, and if they are still speaking at that point, their mic will be turned off. <laughs> Candidates have each been given three wild cards. Show them all, you've all got them. <laughs> they are gonna be able to use these to rebut the comments made by another candidate. Again, they will have one minute to answer. Wild cards must be surrendered as they are used. <laughs> we will provide cards on which you may write your questions. If you have your own pen or pencil, please use that. Otherwise we do have some spares that you can borrow. Please write legibly and hold them up for collection. We reserve the right to edit questions for brevity, relevance, and taste, and to combine questions that are similar in nature. And as we always seem to get more questions than we have time for, please do not be disappointed if you do not hear your specific question asked. Around 8.45 p.m., we will open the floor to questions uh, from the floor, and a floor mic has been set up, or what? how are we, get, we are managing that now? The, we're gonna provide a mic. Uh, the floor mic was not available, so we're gonna provide a mic. Finally, at about 9.10, we will wrap up the meeting with closing remarks from the candidates. I ask and expect the audience and the candidates to be respectful of one another to the proceedings in the proceedings this evening. So let's get started. I always ask this question, hands up, those of you who have come here tonight not knowing who's going to get your vote. <laughs> then you've come to the right place. <laughs> so the question that is going to be asked of the candidates is the following. And once I give him the nod, 
Herman is going to be the first one to answer this question. Briefly outline the qualifications or experience that you will bring to North Vancouver District Council if elected. You have two minutes, Herman. Hello, welcome. My name is Herman Ma. I was born in Vancouver and have lived in the district for over 20 years with my wife, Deborah, and daughter. I'm running for a councillor because I can make a positive difference on council and fight for policies that keep the district a great place to live. I have gained extensive experience working with various levels of government and in management. I have been on the board of the Downtown Vancouver Association for 15 years, and I had managed the uh, BCIT Downtown Campus for nine years. In terms of the district, I have been the vice president of the Permanent Heights Community Association for 19 years, vice chair of the North Vancouver Recreation and Culture Commission, and a member of the Community Services Advisory Committee. I understand the issues faced by people in the district. As someone who's engaged with council and district staff over the years and has experience working with a wide range of community groups, I will bring diversity and a collaborative approach to council. In terms of key issues, we need to address mobility, housing, and to ensure that our local businesses are successful. We need a strong economy because from that comes opportunities for all. These are complex and interrelated issues. Councillors need both ideas and experience to deal with them. We also need to ensure that we don't forget about things that make the district a great and vibrant and safe place to live, work, and raise a family. During the past couple of weeks, I have spoken to other candidates. One different experience that I can bring to council is a deep understanding of housing and affordability. I have worked in the BC Housing Real Estate Department for over five years. I know we can make housing more affordable. For starters, and while balancing the need for light industrial land, we can leverage the funding partnerships with senior levels of government and utilize appropriate district-owned land for housing projects. I look forward to representing you on council on October 15th, vote for Herman Ma. Thank you. You're up, Greg. Thank you for being here. It's great to see all this engagement uh, this evening. So thank you once again. My name is Greg. And I have lived on the North Shore for over two decades with my wife and our two teenage children. As a formally trained journalist with over 25 years in that profession, I appreciate the value of people's views and opinions. And I believe that is an important part of municipal governance. For almost a decade, I owned a small business with my wife on the North Shore, Organics at Home and Sprout Market. I think I see a few customers here. Through that process, I came to understand the needs of local businesses and believe I can help entrepreneurs thrive in our community. I have volunteered for many local organizations, including the monitoring of our stream temperatures for the Pacific Science Enterprise Center, track building for North Shore BMX, helping adults, adults with disabilities through the Greater Vancouver Community Services Society, and volunteer work for the Lynn Valley Community Association. I have also contributed my time to the Lookout Housing and Health Society for over 12 years, and I'm currently chair of their foundation. Last year, the society provided over a quarter million bed nights for lower main mainland residents and provides a much needed alcohol recovery home here on the North Shore. I have overseen provincial funding applied to many types of housing and understand the dynamics of the process. As your counselor, I bring my experience to housing to build an effective vision of the types of homes we need across the North Shore. And while building community is important, so is strong and effective leadership. I recently earned my graduate degree in leadership from Royal Roads University in Victoria. I mean, why, why do it when you're young, right? I spent some time with some of the smartest people in the country, and that taught me lessons that will help me make thoughtful, objective decisions to serve all of us. I find the challenges we face to be exciting, and I believe we can collaborate for a better future for ourselves and our children. My name's Greg Robbins, and I look forward to your support on October 15th. Thomas. Dear neighbors, hello. I am Thomas Sofiq, a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, and I hold a PhD in, P in public law. As one committed to the community and the, de the detected progress, I'm running for the office of District of North Vancouver City Councilor. I hope to bring a new, fresh vision and voice to our district council and shape the future of our community. I believe that contractors of small, medium, or large sizes are equal, viable, candidate for our district. North Vancouver 
is a special place to live, work, and raise a family. I have the experience, problem solving skills, and vision to give our city a bright future and help meet its challenges. Great communities require great leaders. We need leaders with new visions and the dedication to get the job done. And I believe in making decisions based on what we as a community need, not what I think we need. I believe using reports, studies, community feedbacks, etc., to make better informed policy making decision for the community across the board. As all we need, as all we know, growth does not stop. So we should help each other to stay on the right path going forward. Now is the time to band together as a community like never before and network with ideas, technology, and actions. Make and support fair and just laws, volunteer, help, and share. I feel a good district councilor should act as an advocate for our entire community, demanding transparency and results and going to bat for the little guy. And that is what I am good at. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, hopefully it reaches across. Do you want to just test if that one's working? Okay. It always feels, um, my previous uh, gigs, I've done stand-up comedy, so it kind of feels weird to sit down and talk. <laughs> And usually when I'm in front of a crowd like this, I want to tell some jokes, but, you know, not to be sound too opportunistic, but as a Ukrainian Jewish uh, comedian, I feel like it's a pretty good time to be in politics right now. We're, we're pretty popular. Uh, anyways, my name's Ellison Mellon, and I am running for council in the District of North Vancouver. While I am young, I do bring an extensive resume of experience if elected. I'm currently, or I have been working or volunteering in politics for pretty well half my life, which again, isn't that long, but in compare, you know, I'm young, so it's, it's a while, right? I currently work for MLA Susie Chant, uh, who is the uh, MLA here in North Vancouver Seymour. I'm her full-time constituency assistant. And I got that job because of how well connected I am to this community. I know the trails here, I know the schools, I know the routes, I know all the bus routes, all the shortcuts, and uh, most importantly, I know the people. And I know the people from my family who have roots here. They owned a restaurant uh, a while back, sold before the Olympics. I also have extensive volunteer experience working with seniors and teaching kids as well. Uh, my volunteer background also includes 10 years of coaching hockey, three years on the Community Services Advisory Committee, and two years on the district's rental, social, and affordable housing task force. If elected, I hope to bring my expertise in the area of housing and energy policy, which is what I studied in the university, as well as my extensive knowledge of government, funding opportunities, and areas for better collaboration in hopes we can work together and build a community that we can all belong in. Thank you very much. It's reached its limit. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Trey Bell. Uh, this is my first time running for council. I'm a lifelong North Vancouver resident, except for four years that I spent at Acadia University in Nova Scotia getting a political science degree. Um, I also have an associate certificate from BCIT in public relations. I spent my entire working career and my entire working career um, helping and working with children, youth and families in North Vancouver. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've been the director of school age care programs for a company called Behaven Childcare, where I manage six different locations where it's anywhere from two to 300 children and 30 staff. So budget management, staff management, customer relations, and working with outside agencies are all key. Um, and for the past four years, I've been in a voluntary role on the Parkgate Society Board of Directors and the past two years as the vice president of that society's board. Uh, Parkgate does valuable work in the community, as everyone knows, with childcare, youth, and seniors programs at low or no cost. Um, growing up in, in North Vancouver, I witnessed my father, Kevin Bell, help save the Maplewood Bird Sanctuary, which was kind of a pivotal 
uh, time in my life as a child and youth and young man. I volunteered a lot down there, planting trees and just helping that uh, place grow. Um, also through my father, I feel very connected and educated on the environmental issues facing the district, things like loss of, ha loss of habitat, loss of green space, um, work living with bears, um, climate change mitigation, and pesticide use. Um, the values I'll bring are uh, compassion and working with others. I think I can work with anyone at this table and either of the mayors. I think that's a key to be able to work collaboratively together. And um, I would appreciate if you want to check out my website, traybell.ca. Uh, do your research in this election. Vote for people who share your values. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure to meet already, I'm uh, Jim Hansen. I'm a two-term counselor in the District of North Vancouver. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of this event. I know the painstaking work that goes into preparing uh, for this, and I thank you for that work. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, you're doing the heavy lifting today. You're having to decide the future shape of our community by listening to us and casting a vote, and, and for that, I thank you. In terms of the experience that I bring, uh, that was the question that was asked. I'm going to start by uh, recognizing my long uh, marriage to my wife, Ruth, who is in the room. Uh, that marriage has taught me an awful lot about uh, finding common ground and um, recognizing that uh, our differences have to be uh, worked with. And I think that's experience that is very, very useful to a counselor. I also think of my experience as a parent of two adult children and the challenges that they face in their life, especially around housing. And then my experience, eight years on council, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how much I've learned in those eight years, because it says something about how little I knew when I started but it's taught me a great deal about our community, about our priorities, and about local government and what can be accomplished in local government. If I'm re-elected, I intend to use those uh, experiences to prioritize social and affordable housing. That's what we need. And also to uh, prioritize transportation upgrades because that's what we need. By the end of this term in council, we should have a definite plan for rapid transit to and from the North Shore, including budgeting and construction timelines. Thank you for coming out and uh, I look forward to uh, all of the questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Murray. I grew up in Deep Cove and I have 26 years of experience on council. This is my ninth election. I'm going to tell you what I know about the district. With only one exception, council has approved every development application submitted in the last 10 years. And today we have thousands of units built, waiting or being built in the district. The interchange has relieved some internal congestion, but as build out continues in the city and the district, it will fail. Mayor Little is working hard to secure rapid transit to the North Shore, but we are competing for senior government funding. And as the door to the Sea to Sky and Island, we continue to face daily gridlock on Highway 1. All governments and businesses are challenged to find employees. There are lots of sirens, but not enough doctors, nurses, or paramedics. Our health care system is on the brink. This is a balancing act, and right now we are lopsided. Census 21 reported DNV gave occupancy to 4,600 units, while our population only grew by 2,000. Housing has become a commodity, with the feds banning foreign ownership in January 2023. Only increased interest rates have slowed the market, with housing affordability and rental, reach, or rental rates still out of reach for many. The concept of supply and demand to lower prices is a myth. Inflation is skyrocketing and the region has more cars on the road than ever. Our current OCP has not been followed. Triple net leases are unattainable for many small businesses. Our town centers are far from sustainable and we need assessment and tax reform. Social housing, purpose-built rental and co-ops need to be the focus rather than expanding an increased inventory of condos. We need to slow down and take care of what's important, our environment, quality of life, true sustainability, and a future for our kids. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for 
Is that on? Yeah. Good evening, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you all tonight. I'm Betty Forbes, and I'm running for a second term on the council. I have a significant volunteer career before my appointment to council in 2018. This has included working on community boards and committees and advocating for citizens and neighborhoods and a voice for parent advisory committees to the provincial government. I'm a fourth generation North Vancouverite and my sons were raised in Lynn Valley and are proud of their heritage, but I'm afraid that I, that I will be the last of my family to be able to afford to live in Lynn Valley. And that should not happen to any family. I have always defined affordable housing as attainable housing tied to income. I'm an accountant by profession, and in the past, I worked in the DNV finance department. I support forward-looking decisions, and as an accountant, I'm judicious in applying measurement skills, analyzing skills, active listening, and taking a collaborative approach to deliver effective solutions. I am proud to have served on a number of committees during my term, the Finance and Audit Committee, property tax parcel role. I was a commissioner on the North Vancouver Museum and Archives. I was a commissioner. I am a commissioner with the North Vancouver Rec and Culture. I'm also on the advisory oversight committee. And before I was a counselor, I was on the OCP implementation committee. I was on the board of North Vancouver Community Association Network and on the board of the Lynn Valley Community Association. I, mean, I will maintain my focus on community voices. I am listening housing, diverse and attainable, transportation, safe routes for all forms of transportation, SkyTrain, rebuild the Iron Workers Bridge with two decks, bus rapid transit. I will also, I also will focus on infrastructure that it catches up with any growth that is happening. Development needs to pay for itself and fiscal sustainability. Review uh, with fiscal receipt, sustainability, I want to review the revenue streams, municipal charges and fees, and audit the five-year capital plan for relevance in this day. I also would encourage uh, everybody to, uh, to uh, sorry, lost my place, <laughs> environmental sustainability to enforce the current regulations, protect parklands, wildlife, and continue to develop and implement climate change strategies. Thank you. I'm asking for your <laughs> sorry. I'm Clayton Wellwood, uh, first time running for council. And in terms of the the question, you know what what qualifies me for this position? Uh, I want to mention what I do in my professional career, which is I'm a project manager in construction. And so in that job, I don't need to have all the answers. I just need to be the guy that's able to, to bring the right people around the table that, that are experts in their domains and get them all to play nicely together in the sandbox. So I think that that's a, a useful skill that um, I've developed over my, my professional career. And it's one that I come to um, with, a, with a kind of a frame of mind, a kind of a, a disposition that I'm not the person that has all the answers. And so I, I think that's really important. I think that's something that, that you might want to have in a representative, uh, because I don't want to tell you how to live. I believe very strongly in grassroots democracy. And uh, as a, as a counselor, I would just try to be the, the voice of the, the many different points of view uh, that citizens have and try to find ways that uh, people, even though they, they may have uh, divergent ways of, of, of living and different things they want. How can we find the, the, the way that everybody can have the most of what they want? In terms of my volunteer life and, and relevant experience, uh, I was the treasurer for uh, Linmore Elementary School PAC for a couple of years. Um, I was also involved uh, in, a, in a provincial political party for many years. Um, that's, uh, so I was leader, I was president and a few other roles there. Uh, and a few other um, volunteer efforts over the years. But uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Clayton Mullwood is the name. Uh, well, good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Jordan Back, and I just want to begin by acknowledging how grateful I am that we're gathered here on the unceded territory of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, uh, I've served on council since 2018, so this is my first term. 
Um, I bring the perspective of being a lifelong resident of this community. I live in the Lynn Valley area with my wife, Signe, and new since 2018, two kids, uh, Henry and Morgan. So I do bring a little new experience in changing diapers. Um, outside of council, I work in the advertising industry, um, and I work with, a, with businesses and organizations of a variety of sizes on their uh, marketing campaigns. I actually started my career about 15 years ago at the North Shore News, just working with small businesses on the North Shore. Um, I come from a family that believes in community service. Uh, my mom uh, is a city councillor. My dad spent his, his career of over 50 years in local government. So I bring that perspective as well. Um, throughout this term on council, I've served on the library board, which was a very eye-opening experience about how the important role that libraries play in our community today and how important they continue to be. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce board, where I gained experience uh, hearing about the challenges of small businesses, particularly during a pandemic. Um, on the Museum and Archives Committee, when we opened a brand new museum here in North Vancouver, which was really exciting. Um, as well, I served on Metro Vancouver's Industrial Land Strategy Task Force. And outside of council, I've been a longtime volunteer with the North Shore Triathlon, which has been running here in Seymour for over 30 years. I'm very proud of that event. Um, and I'm also a volunteer with my local community association in Lynn Valley. Um, some of the motions that I brought forward this term on council include the pilot programs for alcohol in our parks, as well as a food truck pilot program the fun motions. Um, I also brought some changes to update our snow removal policy and a motion to involve more youth and younger adults in local government decision making. I want to drive positive change, and that's what I'm here to do. Um, I believe in things like enabling greater housing diversity in every neighborhood, and we can talk about what that could look like, but housing that's going to work for young families, our workforce, aging seniors, people with disabilities, Everyone uh, deserves to find appropriate housing in our community. Getting people moving by supporting uh, the 10-year plan for rapid transit, making this a small business-friendly community, and activating our public spaces with more festivals and farmers markets. Finally, we cannot tackle our challenges alone, and I'm a big collaborator and believe that we need to collaborate consistently across the North Shore. I'm Jordan Back, and I look forward to your questions tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Catherine Pope, and I'd also like to acknowledge how grateful I am to be on the Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish Nations lands. I'm a former journalist. I spent two decades at Global TV, and I covered countless uh, municipal meetings and issues and community concerns. As a reporter, I attended many public meetings and public hearings, and the job often involved analyzing complex municipal staff reports, budgets, and data. Um, my journalism training has enabled me to approach issues with a critical lens. I know how to cut through a large amount of information and get to the crux of the problem and come up with solutions. I've talked with and interviewed hundreds of community leaders over many years and activists, and that's made me really good at listening and understanding diverse opinions and what matters to people. It's also fueled my passion for advocacy work since becoming a communications consultant. I wanna be your advocate on council. And I think I bring the kind of experience that will enable me to be successful. In the last 10 years, I've worked with a variety of clients from government and crown corporations to the BC Nurses Union, and most recently, the BC Human Rights Commission. So I bring extensive experience advocating for and collaborating with stakeholders and partners, working with senior leaders, managing projects, building public engagement, and delivering results. I'm also a committed volunteer and have worked with the Adoptive Families Association and the Victoria Foundation over the last 15 years to help find permanent homes for foster kids. In this community, I did the homeless count for North Van in 2020 and was on the pack at Braemar Elementary School when my daughter was there. I'm from the North Shore, I've spent most of my life here, but I'm not gonna pretend that I know everything and all the answers. However, I believe my depth and breadth of experience has given me the right qualifications to be successful as your counselor 
and advocate. Thank you very much. I'm Catherine Polk. Mike working. Oh, okay. Can you hear me all right now? Okay, yeah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Harrison Johnston. My family moved to the district to Lynn Valley about 19 years ago, and this is my first time running for council. I also wanted to acknowledge the Squamish and Slay Tooth Nations, whose unceded territory we're on today. Thank the organizers for all their hard work and everyone for coming out today. I originally got involved in politics as a climate organizer. So that is a big area of experience I bring. I was one of the lead organizers of the youth climate strikes across Metro Vancouver, including organizing the largest protest in Vancouver's history in September 2019, bringing more than 100,000 people to the streets. Uh, through that work, I've also worked with councillors and staff from municipalities across Metro Vancouver to declare climate emergencies and implement climate action plans. I've also met with, lobbied, and worked with provincial and federal government ministers, uh, so I have that experience as well. The climate is what brought me into politics. What has motivated, the experience that has motivated me to run for council is my experience as a young person who grew up in this community. I quickly fell in this love with this community when I moved here, and I hope to one day raise my own family here. But that possibility is getting further and further out of reach for me. The people I went to high school with have mostly moved away from this community or are planning to already. As part of a larger trend of the entire population under 50 years old has been steadily decreasing in the district over the past 20 years. That is not the way to build a sustainable community. We are struggling to have uh, essential workers like teachers, healthcare workers, students, seniors, young families are all struggling to live here and move here. Meanwhile, people who live in the district are commuting to other communities for work, and people who, and most of the essential workers that we need here in this community are commuting here, leading to traffic congestion that I know I do not have to tell anyone, any of you about. So my top priorities for council are climate action, continuing the amazing work this council has done, making sure we're implementing real affordable housing that is affordable for students, seniors, minimum wage workers, the essential workers we need in our community, and active and public transport. So please vote Harrison Johnston on October 15th. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Peter Tivan, and uh, I live in this neighborhood just up from Dorothy Linus School. My wife, Anne, is here, and she owns and operates the Windridge Park uh, Child Care Center in Ron Andrews Rec Center. Uh, we've raised our children here. I, I've spent uh, over 35 years working in the information technology and automobile dealership business where I was a middle and senior manager uh, working on finance and uh, accounting and other, other systems and processes. Uh, I've spent five years applying for this job. Uh, five years where I've gone to pretty much every single council meeting and workshop, read all the reports, made recommendations, begged, pleaded, uh, thanked, and uh, sometimes uh, people would say often criticized a lot of the things going on in council. Uh, and uh, it's given me a distinct uh, set of knowledge and skills of what goes on and what the job is all about. Some of the things I've learned is that I know very distinctly what job I'm applying for. Job, I'm applying for the job of counselor, I'm not applying to be a governor. I'm not applying for a job to control your lives. I'm applying for the job of representing you and protecting your interests at the council table. I'm focused on, on solutions that work and actually fix problems. Uh, I have spent time going to council meetings. I've spent time as the vice chair of the Seymour Community Association. Also for four years, I've been the uh, on the NVCAN board and now am the vice president of the NVCAN Community Association Network Board. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time, basically worked full-time as a volunteer doing the job already. Uh, and uh, my top priorities are transportation for everyone, not just the fit who can take cycles, but also the people who need to take transit and need to take their automobile. That's uh, led me to the solution that I believe it's high time to start talking about and planning about a new second Narrows Bridge. 
because I'm the son of an engineer and bridges don't last forever. This one has a limited life and I wanna start the conversation now. So I'm focused on you and, uh, and uh, ask for your vote on October 15th. Thank you. Matthew. It's coming on. There's a red light. It seems to be working. Does this help? Ah, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Bond, and I'm running for mayor. I'd like to recognize all of those behind me who have acknowledged these unceded lands, which the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people have cared for since time immemorial. So I was riding here from my home in Sealand tonight. I thought about all the things that I love about this community. The rivers and the creeks where on a hot summer's day, my daughters and I will swim and splash with, our, with their friends. The mountains, the forests, and the trails where in the quiet of nature, I get the chance encounter of seeing owls, ravens, and deer. By trade, I'm a professional engineer, and my friends warned me, Matthew, don't come across like an engineer tonight, but it's who I am, I'm gonna do my best. I have 15 years experience as a systems engineer. That means solving complex transportation problems across the province. I have eight years of experience on council where I've been the strongest, most consistent advocate for solutions to housing affordability and modern transportation networks. That combined with my education, my skill and my passion in sustainable community development makes me well suited to lead this council and community over the next four years. We are in a time of unprecedented transformation. The negative outcomes that we are experiencing today are the result of decades of resistance to change, the climate crisis, housing unaffordability, worsening transportation problems. And these negative outcomes will only continue to persist if we don't change. And I know change is hard, but without changing, we're gonna leave these problems to get worse and let our children face the burden of fixing them. That's not okay. Change comes with opportunity. It comes with, comes with possibility. And I know that there's so many solutions that we have right now today that we can do to make our lives better today, but also leave a positive legacy for generations to come. I have my full qualifications and experience on my website, matthewbond.com. I urge you to go there, take a look at my priorities and the ideas I had with the community, compare those to that of my competitor on his website, and be, make an informed vote on October 15th. Matthew Bond, running for mayor. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Little. I'm the current mayor of the District of North Vancouver, and it has been my distinct pleasure to serve in that capacity for the last four years. Thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. Uh, I'm also a former councillor, so I was a council member from 2005 to 2014, three terms, uh, where I had the uh, great opportunity to learn so much about, uh, about our community. Before that time, I also served as the chair of the North Shore Emergency Management Office, the chair of the uh, District of North Vancouver Library Board, and uh, worked on countless uh, volunteer uh, roles throughout the District of North Vancouver. Uh, my wife Kellyanne and I are raising our four kids right here in the uh, Parkgate neighborhood, live over near the fire hall, and I grew up in the Seymour area, went to uh, um, Seymour Heights and Windsor, and uh, a lot of fun. Actually, I'm going to be going back to Seymour to do the student votes program uh, uh, this week, and so I get to go through my old elementary school and look up the old pictures from the 80s. It'll be a lot of fun. And then I think I hit uh, Dorothy Linus on Friday as well, so uh, that's going to be a, a lot of fun for us. 
Um, uh, regionally, I've also been very involved in uh, the regional planning table. So I sit uh, both on uh, Metro Vancouver's uh, uh, liquid waste, solid waste. The liquid waste committee has now taken back that big project, the uh, liquid wastewater treatment plant, to try to get it going again. Uh, that unfortunately has uh, uh, has been a real challenge. And so we're going to uh, take that over and, and uh, get results. Uh, I also sit on the TransLink Mayor's Council, where we've just come up with a very ambitious uh, transit plan for the area. Our our uh, Mayor's Council's 10-year uh, vision over the next 10 years has um, uh, several key improvements for North Vancouver. In fact, it's the most money spent on transit in, uh, in the North Shore's history is coming up in the next 10 years. And so this includes a massive increase in bus service, uh, handy dart service, bus rapid transit. We're going to have a new rapid bus that's 19 hours a day, eight-minute service up into Lynn Valley as well. Um, and then we're also starting down the road towards uh, SkyTrain services uh, to the North Shore. And so the commitment that I fought for with the, uh, the other North Shore mayors in that was uh, uh, that within the first 10 years of the plan, we're going to have a business case, we're going to have a design, and I'm already working to try and get those elements funded. Um, there's so much more uh, I could say about this. Uh, what I, I hope is that you'll take the opportunity for the question period to ask us directly questions. I'm looking forward to answering your questions once again on October 3rd. 15th. I hope that you'll support me. Thank you very much. We now have some questions that have been submitted by the three community associations, and I'm going to start with Herman with this one. The first question comes from Blue Ridge. Will you accept donations from developers? And if so, do you plan to recuse yourself from decisions that involve projects from these developers? Thank you for the question. It may not take two minutes to answer. Okay. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I fortunately come from a very large family and I have a, a strong pool of friends. Because of that, I have not accepted any donations from developers. Please understand, I don't think developers is necessarily a bad word. I work for BC Housing. Part of my job is working with uh, developers, uh, builders, municipalities. We all need to work together, but the key is to make sure that the community gets what it needs. Thank you. Thanks, Herman. Yes, go ahead. You've lost your sign. <laughs> oh. Yep. That, that question. Just go down the line. Okay, fair enough. I'm sorry. Yeah. Got it. Um, the answer is no, I'm actually entirely self-funded. My mother did provide funding for me, so the answer is no, I do not and will not uh, need to provide any extra money uh, from anyone, actually. So um, it is, uh, however, I, I do agree um, um, that developers can be good people. They can provide opportunities for young people, uh, middle class, uh, you know, dental hygienists, mechanics, the people we need in this community to live here. And so when you look at a company like Lane Fab, who is exceptionally good at producing small scale houses for low prices um, that can be placed on a lot, uh, that gives the opportunity for the people we need in the community to live here. Uh, but the answer is no. So thank, thank you. you. Thomas. Uh, thank you. I haven't received any penny from anyone. I don't, I personally don't like donation or commission. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, let's see if this one works out. Staying test. Oh yeah, there yeah. we go. Oh. Um, I have not accepted any developer donation and I did sign the no developer uh, money pledge. On that note, I did get a large donation today from someone who I don't know and I'm still tracking down who that person is. Uh, so if they are a developer, and I, I've said this before, I will return the money because I, I have met my fundraising goals. Thank you. Uh, well, I've not taken any money from developers, nor would I. I've only taken a handful of small donations from family and friends. And um, yeah, I just think impartiality is so key at the district. We're here to serve you, not anyone else. And I would not take money from developers. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Yes, no, uh, Jim Hansen doesn't take money from developers. Over and over again, uh, we witnessed on council that 
uh, from my perspective, the developments were not serving the housing needs of our community, but the profit needs of the development community. And over and over again, I witnessed councillors who received money and campaign donations from those developers vote on developments that would profit those very people. And because of that, I brought a motion, the first of its type in British Columbia, to require councillors, if they have received money from developers, and if they're voting on their proposals, to, disclo to disclo disclose that, and preferably to recuse themselves from any vote on the uh, development. This is an area where uh, we really need to continue to make progress. Campaign finance has distorted public policy and local government. And uh, let us hope that we're turning a new page on that in the district in, in part because of that motion. Thank you very much. Um, I've never taken money from the development industry and I never will. Um, this is my ninth election. Uh, I have only the the largest amount of money I've ever spent on a campaign is thirty four hundred dollars. I average twelve hundred dollars every campaign. Um, I use my signs. Um, some of them are taped together with duct tape. Um, but um, I think it's really important um, that the NDP government um, made a commitment to uh, abolish the ability for developers to directly fund um, campaigns, and certainly um, that was one of the biggest reasons why there was such a mass changeover in the last election, certainly um, with many mayors in the region, um, because they had been funded solely by the development industry or significantly by the development industry. Um, unfortunately, um, they have found another way to um, contribute to campaigns, and it still continues. And I think the NDP government needs to move forward and finish what they started, which is um, campaign finance reform. Thank you. Um, this is my second uh, election that I'm running for, and I did not accept any development money the first time, and I have not accepted any this time, and I've made it clear uh, that I don't want uh, donations from developers. I think there is a, a uh, conflict of interest if you are voting on mega millions of dollars of a project and that person has also donated you money. So I, I believe that's a conflict of interest. And I think the laws, Lisa has just, Councillor Mary has just said something I was gonna say. I believe when they changed the laws in 2017, by not allowing developers to directly fund and from their organizations or corporations, all they did was push the funding underground. So that now people, their employees, their friends are, de are, develop are donating for them, but under the individual's names. And that makes it really hard for a candidate to know the people uh, that are donating to their campaigns and whether they're connected with the development uh, organizations. And that is why I'm pretty much self-funded. I have a few other donations that have come in and I have some donations from my family, but I'm pretty much self-funded the last time, and I am this time as well. Thank you. No developer donations for me, just friends and family. Um, it's on. Uh, so if you've lived on the North Shore for any length of time, as I have, um, you end up having a number of friends that are connected to the development industry, whether they work in real estate or for a development company or a financing company. Um, and so I, I value those friendships, but uh, that being said, I have not accepted any money from anyone uh, connected to the development industry. Um, I did refund one donation in this campaign that was, was directly linked to a development company. So um, that being said, as my colleagues uh, and, and other candidates have said, uh, development's not a dirty word. They're the ones who build our communities. And uh, I have great relationships with many of them. And in fact, I meet with them quite regularly because I value the ideas that they bring. And I think by working with them, you can get a whole lot more done and achieve the sort of housing that you want and the sort of community that you want um, than uh, simply looking at them as, as the enemy or uh, which has actually been stated by one counselor. Um, so for me, uh, I, I don't accept any d d donations from them, but I don't, I'd look at them as partners. Thanks.
Well, I'm operating on a shoestring, as you may have noticed from my lack of signs compared to everyone else. Uh, so no, I don't take uh, any donations from developers and don't intend to uh, either. Also agree with what Jordan has been saying, they're not the enemy, uh, but it does open the door to conflict of interest. So that's the problem. Thank you. I did just quickly want to note before is that developers themselves are no longer able to donate to campaigns. I am very specifically not accepting donations from anyone who is an owner, an executive, or a board member of developers. Developers as a whole are no longer allowed to donate. Only individuals are. Um, on the topic of campaign finance reform, I did just want to mention as a young person myself, I know, I know that a lot of others up here are self-funded or able to. I am not able to donate $1,200 to my own campaign. I don't have that financial ability. So I think it's really important that when we look at campaign, campaign finance, that it is done equitably so that people who have money themselves do not get an advantage during campaigns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, run in two elections. This is my second one and have not taken uh, Develop, developer company money, nor money from the principal employees or senior managers of development companies. I think the thing to remember, certainly uh, developers are a necessary part of our economy. They're not evil people. They're in business just like the rest of us are. But the other thing that we need to recall is that today's shopkeeper can be the future's developer. And I've made it very clear to anybody who donates to me and I'm mostly self-financed in this election, uh, along with my wife, uh, that if you have an issue, come and I'm sitting at the council table. And I've said to them very clearly, if you believe my voice needs to be at the table, please do not donate to me because I will recuse myself. There are two members of the sitting council here who have rejected the calls that I and others have made to recuse themselves when a proposal from people who donated substantial amounts of money to their campaign when their issue came forward. And, uh, you, you know, you're welcome to ask me about those incidents. They're on the record on tape where I and other individuals have, have highlighted those for everyone to know. But I think that's the key is when you have someone who's donated money to you, especially a significant amount, you should step back and not debate and vote on that item. And uh, it, it's important for everybody here to understand, there is a developer recently who brought something through public hearing that they full well know they were gonna get a no. The fees to do so were I think quoted at $77,000. If you're willing to throw that kind of money at getting a no from council, do you really think they bat an eye at throwing $1,250 at a candidate? It's chump change for them in that business. And they do it all the time. And you can see in the financial reports, $100 donations, $50 donations, 500, 1,000, 1,250. And you know what's going on there. You need to recuse yourself and step back for propriety. Thank you. We don't have to wait, but the acoustics in here are actually really good. We are on. Okay, perfect. Okay. I, I think we're going to stand up all night. Are, are we, Mike? Can we just agree to that to now? Okay. <laughs> um, so when I first ran for council in 2014, my story was actually very similar to Councillor Murray's. I spent $3,000, mostly collect, collected in small donations uh, from friends. In 2018, I ran with a party, and that party did accept donations from developers. And based on the uh, debate that we had with Councillor Hansen uh, and his policy that brought forward, uh, I did acknowledge and disclose any of those donations that happened to that party. Now that I'm running my own campaign in this election for mayor, 
I have publicly declared that I'm not accepting any donations from people related to development companies. And if someone does donate and it's and it gets through the system somehow, that I will recuse myself from any vote uh, uh, along those lines. I did receive one $250 donation from someone that I identified as a principal in a, a development company, and I promptly refunded that and sent them a note. Uh, I'd like to touch on the point that uh, Harrison raised here. Yeah, I do not have a, come from a wealthy family. I'm probably not getting an inheritance. Um, I, am, I have three jobs as a, a young father. It's very expensive to live in this community. I do not have access to $1,200 donations, $1,000 donations from friends, family, work colleagues that might be lawyers or, or real estate agents. Um, I'm relying on lots of donations, $100 donations, $200 donations from people like me, young parents that are working on my campaign in between dropping their kids off at daycare and picking them up at school. If we want to address conflicts in election financing, we need to take the money out of it. And I, I th I'm not sure if this was where uh, Harrison was going, but we should have, we should really explore publicly funded elections so that everyone has the same opportunity, no matter their income, no matter how well connected they are, no matter how much income they have or their friends have, to have an opportunity to participate, to come up here, to join this table and to have a fair campaign to get their ideas on the table. Interesting idea. Uh, so uh, I've already rejected a few donations coming uh, forward from uh, the development community this campaign. I rejected five from the development community last time. Let me say very clearly, there is no confusion on their part as to why they're donating to your campaign. They want you to answer the phone. They want you to meet with them. They want you to give them their ear. Um, and so people who say, oh, it's, you know, it's just because they, they, they like the way we, we do business. No, there's no confusion on their part. Um, but having said that, I still do pick up the phone. I still meet with them. I still go out for coffee with them. Whenever somebody has ideas for a community and how they want to change it, and they're willing to put the time and effort in, I'm going to sit and list with them. I'm going to meet them and, and have coffee with them because I think it's important for our community to have uh, people in these positions who are open and welcome and will go and, um, and listen to the developers. But one of the things I was going to say, if I still got some time before I get uh, knocked off here, is... Uh, um, when, when I vote on a development, what I tend to do is I tend to go, okay, well, are we in the ballpark here? Uh, it may not get my first vote um, at the first thing, but I may vote to revise the project. And then I sit down with the developer and I say, look, this is a flat neighborhood. Let's try and bump up the level of, of housing for persons with disabilities. This is an area where we have a shortage of rental housing. Let's try to negotiate a better deal for the community. People who vote for projects at the first opportunity to vote and try to pass them the first time, never sit down and negotiate with the developers to try to get the best they can for the community. And I think it's critically important that you stock your council here and your and, and with, with mayor and council that are going to uh, try to maximize the benefits that you get back from every development that you do decide to put forward. I think that we need to moderate our growth in the community, but uh, the development community can provide some uh, housing that is going to meet the needs in our community. And so you have to be willing to talk to them, you have to be willing to sit down, but you also have to have the wisdom to know when to say, stop, this isn't in the best interest of the community. Stop, it's going to demovict affordable housing in our community. Stop, this isn't the appropriate project. But you know what would be, and then sit down and talk with them about the potential to actually meet the community's needs through those developments. So uh, I, I do keep an open ear to it, but I will never accept donations from the development community. Thank you. Our next question is from the Seymour. Yes. Oh, Peter. I, I don't know that it's okay. Fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Peter has something to say. I'm hard to miss. I've been jumping up and ah. I actually wanted to follow up on what Councillor Vaughn said. Um, uh, I'm glad to hear this new leaf because it was what six weeks ago that I asked. Councillor Bond to step aside and recuse himself on the Travelodge. 2050 to 2070 Marine, 27 story tower. It was supposed to be mixed use. Uh, we replaced two, uh, two restaurants and a hotel with a 500 square foot coffee shop and 27 floors of condos. 
Uh, he received money, significant money from two principals of the holding company that owns the property. I asked him to step back. He acknowledged the receipt and debated and voted anyway. I believe it was the cast, uh, cast the deciding vote on that. So this is a great new approach. Um, I'm glad to see it. I uh, will look forward for it in the future. Uh, it's what I've been asking for all along. It's what uh, Councillor Hansen's been asking for, but is not what has been happening to date. Uh, the call to recuse himself was rejected. And uh, um, Councillor Murray said that the NDP government wanted to get this. I would say they haven't been serious about it because from the 20. 14 election where corporate donations were allowable to the 2018 where they weren't, developer money went up by over 40%. How does that happen? Uh, everybody saw here probably the news, Kennedy Stewart had a quota list for major developers to, to raise money among their supporters. We still have, the, the problem with developer money is huge. Again, developers are not evil they are just trying to do their business. And if they can get access, it's small potatoes to them. So a recusal is what's important. That, that call has been rejected multiple times from two sitting members of this council. And uh, uh, it's great to see a pledge that it's gonna change, but I will look forward to that because I haven't seen it so far. Thank you. Our next question is from the Seymour Community Association, and at the request of people watching at home on the Zoom, I'm going to announce the names of the speakers as they answer. So, Herman Ma, this is the question, and then we'll go down the line. I'll just call your name ahead of time. Affordable housing is a major concern in the local market, causing the exodus of a generation to distant communities, often with significant impact on families and the economy. As well, many of the people we, we rely on for essential services cannot afford to live here and must commute. What role do you believe a local government should play in the provision of non-market housing? Herman Ma. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, um, my day job is with BC Housing, so we, we deal with a lot of uh, situations where we're trying to advocate and, and produce uh, non-market housing. I think there is a role for government, uh, local government to do that. The, the key is working in partnership with senior levels of government for funding. Uh, when I was at BC Housing, they announced a program, it was 8 billion with a B for housing, uh, to build 114,000 units, various types, various programs, but the high level was 114,000 over 10 years. There's money available in dealing with uh, senior level governments. We need to look at that and take advantage of that. At the same time, local government can also produce their own housing with uh, using district owned land, but it has to be very selective. So there is a role for local government and the key is to partner with senior levels of government and to select uh, district owned land selectively. Thank you. Thank you. Greg, Robin. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. And, um, you know, I would like to echo a lot of what Herman was just saying. Um, there are many levels of government that can provide uh, funding to help not only build, but uh, to assist people in purchasing a home. Uh, for instance, there's the BC Housing of Affordable Home Program, which seeks to pay for 50% of a down payment on a home, uh, which would allow somebody earning about $57,000 to actually purchase a home. So if we look at these types of programs and discover ways in which we can collaborate with provincial entities and, and federal entities, and by the way, there is more federal money coming down the pipe. I was speaking with Jonathan Wilkinson about uh, three weeks ago or so, and he was telling me about the opportunities for the District of North Vancouver to be able to tap into this money. The, the key is that, in his words, you got to go tap into it. Otherwise, it will not come your way. It will be scooped up by somebody else. So BC Housing, Affordable Home Program. Um, and, you know, it's just uh, looking at ways of, of planning this out and putting it into the agenda of, of the, the, um, uh, the value set for the, um, for the district. Thank you. Thomas. Thomas Tofig. Thank you. 
uh, affordable housing must be changed from word to action. Property tax increase should be avoided at this time. We should invite small and medium-sized developers to build row homes, duplex, and townhouses in our community. The affordable housing issue requires a study and communication with the provincial and federal government to allocate a budget to build rental condos with reasonable rent, as well as build pre-sale condos by the provincial and federal government for the middle class. The, this combined with reducing property taxes could help reduce the cost of existing homeowners, renters, and buyers and decrease the living expenses for all. Thank you. Thank you. Ellison, Ellison. Thank you. I think the first thing municipal governments need to do, and I'm, I really want the District of North Vancouver to do, whether or not I'm elected, is actually define what affordability means, create a, a clear definition for developers to come with then uh, and bring to the table that we then vote on. Because at this point, we're leaving it up to the whims of a, a developer or planner to say, oh, affordability is 10% below market. Well, 10% below market is still $2,000 in some places in uh, North Vancouver, 2000 for one bedroom. So I think that's the first thing that needs to happen. Uh, we also have to update our zoning bylaws to make things more simple and more clear. And finally, I think this is also part of the reason why I decide to run in the first place, uh, which a uh, few folks have already tapped on. There is money out there. There's a, a lot of money from senior levels of government. And for some reason, it, it keeps getting distributed and the district in North Vancouver doesn't seem to get any. And I think we really need to, to change that by having more proactive relationships with senior levels of government. Thank you. Hey, Bill. Uh, thank you. I'm going to say I live in the Sea Lynn community, the Lower Lynn area, and having a diverse housing mix there has allowed me to stay in North Vancouver. I wouldn't be able to afford a semi-detached home or, de or a detached home. So um, I think a diverse housing mix is important. And like Mike, like Mayor Little was talking about, we need to go to developers and say, this is what we want. We want affordable rental as part of new developments. We want um, so social housing and we want rent to own rent to own is something I haven't heard talked about a lot in the district, but rent to own is a way for people who are in their 20, 20s or 30s to get into the housing market. And there's $2 billion program from the federal government that was just announced, I think three weeks ago now. And that is money we can tap into for rent to own programs so people's children can stay in North Vancouver and not have to move to far flung communities. Uh, yeah, thank you. Jim Hansen. Yeah, th thank you very much. I certainly agree with the comments about senior levels of government. A above and beyond that, though, we have the zoning power. Local government has the powers to create affordable housing. And yet, uh, one of the last major votes of this uh, council, a 4-3 vote approved 27-story concrete tower with uh, 330 expensive strata units, only 20% uh, affordable, and 337 parking stalls right at the busy intersection of uh, Maine and Capilano. We didn't need to do that. We had the zoning power. We could have decided what was there. We could have put the housing there that our community needs, not the housing that the developers need to make their big profits. We simply have to set the agenda. We have to collaborate with the development community and also with senior levels of government. And we need to ensure that we are creating the housing we need in our community, which is affordable rental, social and supportive housing, housing for the homeless, housing for the elderly, housing uh, for the disabled people with disabilities. It's not more of this multi-million dollar expensive condos uh, in the wrong locations. We simply have to change track. Lisa Murray. 
Uh, thank you. So um, affordable, affordability is different to all of us. Um, we all define affordability um, uniquely. Um, I will tell you that the District of North Vancouver has been one of the largest um, supporters of social housing on the North Shore for decades. Um, I know Janet Pavlik, I think, is here in the audience, and her husband, John Pavlik, and my father, Glenn Murray, um, along with many um, business people in the community, built hundreds of units of social housing with the Lions Housing Society, and that has supported this community um, in a very sustainable way, and we need to do more, more of that. In the town centers, um, such as Lower Lynn, um, there, it, there was um, very few opportunities in the previous council to this one, uh, very little interest in um, social housing and looking at affordability in that community. In Lower Capilino's town center, uh, there was none envisioned, um, which um, is a great loss for creating a sustainable town center. Um, the biggest um, thing that a municipality can do, other than what Councillor Hansen has talked about in regards to zoning, is to give land for social housing, and that is what the district has done for years, specifically with the Lions. Um, Non-market, uh, let's talk about that for a couple of seconds before my time runs out. Um, Non-market is 10% below market, 15% below, below market. When you get 2.5% every year in an increase in rent, um, that non-market allowance disappears rather quickly and that needs reform. Thank you. Betty Forbes. Thank you. Um, one of the ways that this council has done quite a bit more than any other council has been in this last term, uh, has been using our district lands and working with partners. And by giving the, the, the land with a housing agreement, we are, we are providing uh, a place to build with a lot less cost. Um, we also, um, I, I think the municipality could review their DCC charges, their development cost charges and their uh, community amenity uh, charges and those could be looked at and the possibility depending on the project those could be lowered um, one of the other ways that we could keep some affordable affordable housing and i still have always defined affordable as attainable according to income so i i don't have any quivering about what I think is affordable. Um, but one of the ways we could do that is by protecting, and what we've been trying to do is protect the older purpose-built rentals. And instead they've been zoned and they've been, by other councils, they were zoned and, and expensive housing was built on them. And we have, families have been evicted because of votes that, have, that has happened. And that's not right for anybody. Also, we need diverse housing choices such as co-ops, rent to owns, duplexes, triplexes, and housing has become a commodity and it should not be. It should be, everybody should be entitled to housing, whether you're seniors or your workers or your middle-class families, you should be all entitled to have the chance to have a home. Thank you. Well. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a proper role of government to provide housing or build housing. I think that the right role for local government is to, to cut the red tape that is driving up the cost of housing. Uh, and, and Betty mentioned some good ideas in that, in that regard. One I will mention, though, if the residents of North Vancouver do want to see more non-market housing, maybe there is a way for uh, the community amenity contribution system to be reformed so that residents of North Vancouver can request that as a type of community amenity contribution. So if residents had a say in that and a developer proposed a project and you know the question is put to the people in the area, you know, do you want a park? Do you want trail upgrades? Do you want a rec center upgrade? Or do you want non-market housing? And if so, who would that housing be for? So I think that uh, there's a way that uh, residents can have a, a greater voice in in that. So, okay. you got this. Jordan back. Yes, thank you. So uh, lots of good ideas here. Um, 
you know, non-market housing and the provision of housing is not a traditional responsibility of local government, but when you're in a housing crisis, uh, when you're in a climate emergency, there's a lot of things that aren't traditional roles of local government that now are things that we need to handle. Um, I agree with many of the uh, types of solutions that have been proposed here. I think it really is about having strong partnerships, both with other levels of government, both with First Nations. Uh, here on the North Shore, the tsleil is is doing everything they can to try and, and build some housing for their people, and, and it would include some workforce housing as well. And I, I would love to see some, some real workforce housing, um, because it, it's not right that so many of our first responders or firefighters and uh, healthcare workers, they don't live on the North Shore. Um, we have focused a lot on non-market housing with this council, and I think in some ways the pendulum may have swung a little bit too far one way. Um, I think we need to look at the whole housing spectrum because it's not just below market housing that we need. Um, you know, I, my wife is a nurse. I, I know how much uh, nurses make. Um, they're not necessarily looking for non-market housing, but they they're not looking for a single family house and they may need something in between. And so we always have to kind of look at the whole housing spectrum to make sure that we're um, looking at all the needs and not just uh, non-market, but it, it's definitely an area that we need to continue to focus on and continue to uh, build those strong partnerships so that we can get it built. Catherine Pro. I agree with uh, very much of what's been set up here in terms of ideas. I think, however, that it is our role is to ensure essential housing for our community. And it's getting pretty ugly out there and it's gonna get a lot worse. And the reason is we haven't been moving forward quickly enough on building and development. Um, so I feel like we need to look uh, more closely at using district lands, at partnering with BC Housing. When they come to the table, and they've got millions and millions to invest in housing, we need to say, yes, please, <laughs> and build it so that our kids, my daughter, your parents, others that I've talked to in the last few weeks that are desperate for their families and relatives and others to live here so that they have a future in this community. It's critical. Um, I agree we need workers housing that also feeds into the transportation and congestion problem. Um, and, uh, and in general, actually, we do need even according to the 2021 uh, district housing needs report that the district did, we need to build just about 3000 units by 2026. And we're a hugely long way from that. So again, I feel we need to move forward with many of these ideas. Harrison? I definitely agree with a lot of what has been said as well. Um, I think we need to do more. That's a simple fact. A lot of the affordable, supposedly affordable non-market housing that has been built is not considered affordable for someone on a starting teacher's salary, a starting nurse's salary in the district. I find that unacceptable. It is not traditionally the role of municipal governments to be building housing to be in that game, but it is a simple fact that our provincial and federal governments, we've had these governments in place for many years, they have not provided the funding we need for affordable housing in the district. So we need to be do, doing everything that we can as a municipality to build the affordable housing as we need. I agree with Ellison, we need to set a definition of affordable housing that needs to go beyond just the essential workers we need in our community. I also believe that students who grew up in this community should be able to afford to live here while they're in school, and that seniors who have worked in this community for many years and are retired also should be able to afford here, and not in unacceptable conditions like they have in places like Silverlin. We need to be doing everything we can, building more housing. It's a simple fact that makes housing more affordable. We need to be working with all the partners we can to be building non-market social co-op housing. We need to increase our housing diversity by allowing and incentivizing things like coach houses, uh, duplexes, secondary suites across the community. Thank you. Peter T. Van. Thank you. Um, this is a very critical area and something I've spent a lot of time on. Uh, first of all, I begged the 2014 and 20 to 2018 council to define affordable, because if you saw the number of people who went before that council and told them they should build this development or that one because it, quote, had affordable development, you would give up trying because 
those developments were not affordable. Uh, we need to define affordable. Affordable you, to me either means rent geared to income or rent that is 30% of the median Metro Vancouver income, not the North Shore income. That's $30,000 a year more than Metro Vancouver income. Uh, but we don't just need affordable rentals, for example, for workforces. We also need affordable home ownership options. Now, you all passed this uh, development right here at the corner. It's called 27 North. It was uh, put forward in 2018 by the Tatla Development Corporation. When that one sold, the first thing is I went to a builder and I said, what is the cheapest housing to build per square foot? He said, simple, three to four story wood frame walk up. Anyone who tries to tell you that high density is the way to affordability is selling something. And then what they're selling is the developer's business plan. High density is the best way to get the most profit per square inch of land, period, stop. The ones out here at Parkgate, about $1,740 1740, $1, a square foot selling price. June 18th, 2018, Councillor Bond passed, cast the deciding vote that saw 62 North Vancouver families evicted out of purpose-built rental housing at Emory Village to be replaced with 400 condos. Those ones, $2,200 a square foot. Density does not lead to affordability. If it did, Lower Lonsdale, Lower Cap would be the cheapest places to live. Matthew Bond, please. Uh, Mike and I have agreed to sit until the end of the meeting. So uh, we have agreed. Uh, I, I'm glad uh, Canada Teven mentioned Emory Village. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, the past council had was that all of the growth in the official community plan was designated on top of areas where homes already exist. The system was broke from the start. And that made me realize that we need to do a lot more and a lot quicker to bring affordable housing to this community. This council, uh, starting in 2018, actually had five affordable housing projects in agreement with BC Housing. In the, some of the first two decisions, two of those were canceled. Two of them went forward and one was deferred. It was my motions, a, a series of motions, to bring those closed decisions out from into the public to look at all the district land available for affordable housing to prioritize those lands and to bring them forward now today that has those extra proposals in Maplewood, which myself and Councillor Back voted in favor of, at Mount Highway in Lynn, Lynn Creek Town Center and at St. Denis. Those are on the table because of the actions and the motions that I brought for, for, for Council. So we do need to proceed a lot quicker. We can't just build affordable or social housing because families, young people uh, need apartments as well. The bar is simply too high for single family homes and we need a much greater variety of housing across the spectrum. And Mike Little. Thank you very much. Uh, there's been uh, a few comments about the definition of affordability. So the district does have a working definition of affordability. The challenge is, uh, if you're going after deep dive affordable housing, you need to have a partner. And it's the partner's definition that, that guides the project. BC Housing tells you what the, uh, the definition of affordability is going to be under their calculation. How many are going to be low? How many are going to be rent geared to income? How many are going to be uh, based on moderate incomes? Uh, if you're working with the CMHC, they have a different calculation. And if you're working with Metro Vancouver as well. So it, it's uh, the definition is malleable to some degree, but it's really the partner that's bringing the subsidy dollars that sets that definition. Uh, when it comes to new housing, there is no affordability. And this is the challenge. 10% uh, off of new is not affordable. When you're building at about $1,200 a square foot, uh, where you're selling at $1,200 to $1,700, $2,000 a square foot up in Edgemont, that means a 1,000 square foot unit is coming in at $2 million 
providing a 10% discount does not make it affordable. If you want affordability in this community, you need to protect uh, um, the existing uh, low cost due to age housing in our community, wherever you reasonably can, you have to make sure that it's properly maintained. Uh, and this, this points to one of the games that's out there. So, uh, you know, you'll have a development that'll come forward and someone will go to a bank financier and the financier will come along and say, uh, this, this project needs a new roof in about 10 years, but it's been well maintained. It's a very good asset. You can buy the asset. And so the developer comes along and they, they use that as an excuse to buy the asset to maintain it. It's been in great shape. Amazingly, once the developer gets the asset, uh, that same company comes back and says, oh, it's way beyond its economic useful life. This thing is a, is, is a death trap and we need to redevelop this property. And so the challenge is we're up against that where people are um, uh, using these definitions to, to force the demoviction of those properties, to force the destruction of those properties. And that is the truly affordable housing in our community. The final question to all candidates is from the Deep Cove Community Association, and I'm going to ask if you can keep your answers to 30 seconds, because we want to get into the audience questions. All right. Traffic impacts are a reality of popular destinations. What tools does Council have or can Council take to manage and mitigate traffic in such areas? And we'll start with Herman Ma. Again, thank you. <laughs> traffic is by far the number one issue in the district, because I think uh, if we're not being able to get around, it's gonna affect our quality of life. The best thing that uh, the municipality can do is in encourage uh, no, people to get out of the cars by having, but we need to do that by having options for them, uh, better buses, uh, better uh, and safe uh, active transportation lanes or, or bike lanes. So there is a role for government, but uh, you know, to improve transportation. Greg Robbins. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with Herman's comments as well. And when you take a look at Deep Cove specifically with the Gallant Street um, um, feedback that was provided on the forum, you know, many, many individuals in this community are talking about, you know, either accessing this area by the people who are visiting through a shuttle system to just take the cars out, let the people in to shop and visit and have a great time, but it's the cars and cars don't buy things, people do. So it's more important to bring the people than the cars in. We could also certainly boost up active transportation and divide that uh, bike route along uh, Mount Seymour Parkway to make it actually rideable. Thank you very much. Thomas Topic. Thank you. Traffic in our community is a big issue. I would like to tackle this issue from several angles. Active and smart public transportation. All bus stops need to be installed with the shelters and benches. Encourage people to use bicycles, but we need safe routes for them. Thank you. Thank you. Allison now. Okay, 30 seconds, yikes. I know this is an area that has been disproportionately affected by traffic going to tourism destinations like Mount Seymour and, and Deep Cove. I think we have to start looking at very creative solutions to get people out of their cars. Um, I would love to talk more with everyone after this, but some ideas I have are a foot ferry from Port Moody to Deep Cove in the summer. I think that would be a great tourism uh, type thing an active transport paved path from Blue Ridge to Park Gate Center along the bottom of Mount Seymour uh, that can be used all season. Uh, TransLink has just unveiled a new uh, type of bus they call the bike bus, which I think can fit up to 40 bicycles. We need to bring that to the North Shore, start using it to access our mountain bike trails on Seymour and, and on Frome and, and other areas that are very popular for cyclists because that is the majority of the traffic in this area in many days. Uh, but yeah, please talk to me afterwards. I have tons of ideas on this. Thanks. Ray Bell. In the Deep Cove area, we have the uh, Myrtle Park and uh, Cove Cliff School areas where there's ample parking. That The trick is getting visitors to the Cove to park there. Some ideas we could use a shuttle service that could take a five minute shuttle bus from the, from those parking areas to the cove. Another uh, idea would be to uh, inform the people who are driving down the road if there is actually parking in Deep Cove. So much like at a mall, you would see, oh, par lot is full, divert to the other parking lots. Um, also, I'd be able to, in favor of looking at uh, pay parking in Panorama Park. 
as again, we just need to divert people to use those other parking areas and walk over to the cove or take a shuttle bus. Thanks. Jim Hansen. Yeah, th thank you very much. I'm going to answer the question in the context of my home uh, community of Blue Ridge. And what we've seen here is a knock on effect of development in other parts of the lower mainland where people are built up in a very densified way they need recreation but they come into blue ridge and at times now that it's, it's a a disruption to a peace and enjoyment of those people who have homes and have made blue ridge their uh, neighborhood uh, the proposal that i would have i think it's time that we uh, uh, prioritize the neighborhoods the residential neighborhoods as just that there are residences there for people to live in and we're going to have to find uh, alternate parking arrangements other places for them to park and uh, then and if they want to access the trails and so forth, they can ride up the roads or perhaps, uh, as Trey suggested, some type of uh, shuttle service. But I don't think we should take it as a given that uh, our residential neighborhoods get overrun by, by visitors. Yeah, thank you. Lisa Mary. Thank you. I um, I sit as the district's rep on the Metro Vancouver board. I sit on the Parks Committee, the Planning Committee. Uh, I chair the Culture Committee, and uh, I sit on performance and audit as well, representing the municipality. Metro is looking currently at a study between Port Moody, Belcara, and Deep Cove for a passenger ferry. In the old days when my dad was growing up in the Cove, there was a ferry that came from Vancouver to drop off the summer residents. Um, we've been talking about a shuttle in this community as long as I've been elected, and so far far um, we haven't seen one we did have small buses that would come into park gate and the small buses went down to deep cove but generally the buses are filled when they're coming from uh from fibs exchange and they need to be larger um there's two municipal or two communities in metro vancouver that have dealt in my opinion with um, the challenges that we face and that's the west end and horseshoe bay can i use this as a extra Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Horseshoe Horse Bay. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, Horseshoe Bay and the West End. And you just don't take your car to either of those communities because you know you can't park. So you need to engineer and you also need to restrict access into these areas to force people to use other ways to get to the places that they want to visit. Thank you. Thank you. Forbes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say I'm in favor of active transportation as well as automobiles because not everybody can do active transportation. Never mind get from point A to point B that's, you know, 40 miles away if that's the destination that you want to go to. So um, one of my suggestions is um, I think we should open up access, especially on the weekends, open up access to other facilities that we have in the district, such as rec center parking, uh, school parking. Uh, we should open that up for people to be able to park their cars there. And then we wish to have shuttles that would run to the destinations. That would cut down on the actual vehicles on the road and provide a much easier uh, access. Um, I'm thinking of Capilina Road as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm ag in agreement with the issues that are out here in Deep Cove, but Capilina Road has three destinations on it. And now we have Lions, Lionsgate Village. So we're gonna have excessive traffic there. Um, and so I think that the any destination uh, that charges a fee for coming to their destination should provide uh, Free tran a free shuttle from wherever we've provided the parking. Thank you. Clayton Wilbur, please. So if the problem is too many people driving to Deep Cove on a sunny Saturday afternoon, I think a toll would be a good solution because it would incentivize people to take alternatives, right? If you have a toll there, people think twice about driving, you know, their vehicle. Maybe they will take transit, maybe they will take a bike. Maybe they will take a shuttle. Maybe now there is more incentive for people to take a shuttle, provide exemptions for local residents to the tools and turn the tools off at nighttime and non-peak times when traffic is not a problem. Thank you. Jordan back. Um, yeah, so we have implemented a number of uh, demand management tools uh, on some of the busier areas like uh, Deep Cove and uh, and and Lynn Canyon, where we introduce pay parking. Um, so that's that's one thing we can do. Um, I like the idea of potentially a shuttle or an on-demand uh, shuttle option. There's something in the city of Powell River called the Zunga bus, and I was 
actually born in Powell River, uh, and it's a local term, the Zunga, but that's a different story for another time. Um, but it's an on-demand transit service, and I think we could look for something like that, maybe partner with a private company to offer something to some of those more popular areas. Um, and I think safe active transportation routes, you know, we tend to encourage people to ride their bike out to Deep Cove, and there is no safe way to get there. Um, I had the pleasure of riding up Mount Seymour Parkway tonight on my bike, and I can tell you it's not a pleasant experience. Um, so we need to have safe routes uh, to get out to these locations as well. Catherine Pope. It's always great to go after Jordan because I can usually just say what he said. <laughs> These are good ideas, and I agree, and I also think that we need to um, maintain pressure and be a strong voice for the North Shore with transit and, and push for increased transit and push for more direct routes and, and core along our key corridors, especially east-west routes. Um, bike lanes need to be made safer, um, and... Uh, the of course can't forget that housing for workers is is another piece of the congestion equation so if we're building more housing for people and they don't have to commute over and back and 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 along the parkway every day wherever um then that would help reduce some congestion as well thank you harrison thank you for me the solution is pretty simple we need to provide people a real choice a real option to not use their cars to commute. Um, personally, I don't own a car, so I rely on buses to get everywhere in our community. And I can say at peak times, especially on summer weekends, when I'm taking my bus from Lynn Valley across the bridge, there is a massive lineup of tourists at Tibbs Exchange who don't get on the bus because the bus is completely full every weekend afternoon. And all of those people, if you look at it from their perspective, they're not going to take the bus again. If they have that experience of waiting for a bus for an hour, they're going to decide to drive next time. So we really need to provide people with much more reliable, frequent public transit service on weekends. And as has already been mentioned, our bike routes, especially out to Deep Cove, are incredibly unsafe and unpleasant to use. So that's also important to improve. Thank you. Peter T. there. Thank you. If COVID has taught us anything, it is that uh, everyone in Metro Vancouver wants what we have here on the North Shore. We now have more traffic going northbound on the Iron Workers Bridge every Saturday morning than go southbound on any workday. They're coming here and they're not going to take active transportation because they're coming and they're bringing four riders and four mountain bikes and they want to access the trails. They don't want to ride here. They drive to the spot and then they deploy their bikes. They don't want to take the bus because you can't bring a kayak or a paddle board on the, on the bus. They're bringing sports equipment with them. They want to access the outdoors. There's one answer, and that is a brand new iron workers bridge, two decks, six lanes per decks with LRT protected bike lanes. The bridge we have is going to start falling down within 20 years. It need, we need to start working on a new bridge. Matthew. Did anyone here participate in the Deep Cove dialogue where we discussed this in depth uh, a number of years ago? Anyone here? So we spent hundreds of hours talking about this issue. Almost all of those solutions have been implemented except for pay parking in the Cove. So I think we need to look at that and reinvest the money from that back into the Cove. Um, a district cannot continue to tell people that the parking lots are full ride your bike when you have to either have to ride the Dalton death trap or Mount Seymour highway to get there. We need a safe route for people to ride their bikes into the cove. Um, and with the popularity of our destinations, we really need to, especially like Quarry Rock, if it opens up again, we really need to look at a pass system. Popular destinations around the world use pass systems to mitigate the impact of visitors on both the environment and the impact on residents. So I think those are three ideas that we can do in Deep Cove. Mike. And, and for clarity, yes, we do intend to reopen Quarry Rock when it's safe to do so. Uh, we're doing a, a, a partnership project on it right now to upgrade it. Uh, a number of the areas in it were damaged during the rainstorms last year, and we had to bring it back up to standard. 
Uh, this is a problem that's going to get worse as people in the rest of the region are building smaller and smaller places to live. More and more people are going out for destination recreation on the weekends. They don't have a backyard. They don't have a place to um, to work on the, on the weekends. And so they, they take off and they head to the parks and they come to the North Shore in droves. So much so that our weekend daily traffic is now higher than our weekday traffic. So we have 131 thousand daily trips on average for our weekdays, 135,000 daily trips for our weekends. And so, and that's actually holding back the demand because there's even more demand for it. Um, I have supported uh, pay parking in, um, in our parks with an exemption or with an annual pass available to residents at a very modest uh, rate. I think that the pilot has shown that it's uh, something that can work and be expanded to more areas. And so as residents, you would pay an annual fee, it's modest. Uh, but the people that are coming would be contributing back to the maintenance of those spaces. And keep in mind the maintenance that they're costing us. So we used to have two park rangers in the district of North Vancouver. Now we're up to 12. And we have to have those to manage the traffic at all of these key places and make sure that people aren't blocking up access. And so uh, this demand is causing a cost for the municipality and it should be recouped through pay parking with a, with a resident uh, pay pass uh, uh, at a modest rate. This question is directed toward the two mayoralty candidates, and I will read it. Oh, wild card from Harrison. Okay. Oh, is my mic on now? Okay, yeah. I just wanted to respond a bit to what both Peter and Mike said. I think that the tourism coming into our communities is absolutely vital. You talk to a small business owner in the community, especially in areas like Lynn Valley and Deep Cove, their small business could not survive without the tourism that is coming in. So it is vital that we maintain that, but the solution is not to bring more cars to our community because as everyone knows, our parking in areas like Deep Cove and uh, Lynn Canyon is completely overloaded. There is no way to accept twice as many cars. The solution is really simple. We need much better better infrastructure. Um, we need dedicated bus lanes across the Second Arrows Bridge, which is already in the 10 years mayor plan. Also, east-west, we need much better going out to Deep Cove, going up to Lynn Valley. We need dedicated areas for buses because we, as we've seen, even with the um, at the bottom of Mountain Highway, the expansion of roads there and the highway there, expanding roads is not solving the traffic problem in our community. There's one simple solution. It is getting people out of cars. That is the only way we are going to be able to do that. Thank you. People that Thank you. Thank you. Allison wishes to rebut. One, two, there you go. Sorry, um, this is, uh, yeah, I'll be quick. This is just something I didn't bring up because I was, I was hoping someone else will bring it up, but I know everyone else will agree with me because they'll all nod wisely when I say it. Um, one thing we have missed when we're talking about key destinations and, and improving transit and active transport is people who are mobility impaired and who need a car to get there. And I think that is an essential thing we need to keep in mind and a, a very simple solution. And it's part of the whole engineering uh, solution that Councillor Miri mentioned as well is increasing the number of handicap spots at our public parks and our major destinations so that those who have mobility issues can actually use our public facilities. Thank you. Thanks so much. This question goes to the mayoralty candidates. This individual writing this question is fairly new to the area, but it appears to me that the district tax base is mainly supported by the residential sector rather than the industrial commercial sector. Does the district have a designated light medium industrial corridor or area set aside for such designated development and what measures are being taken or could be taken to attract businesses to it, which would help reduce the stress on the residential tax base? We'll start with Mike. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, uh, yes, we do have uh, a variety of land designations within the industrial class, not just simply heavy industry. We do have uh, light industry, what we call um, easy LI, which is employment zone light industrial with the, in the expressed intent to uh, add to the employment intensity on some of those spaces. Um, but the specific question is about the portion of taxes they pay. That's simply a council decision. As the council is going through uh, our tax deliberations, uh, we have the ability to shift taxes from 
uh, one class over to another class. I'm trying to recall, I think last time's about 88% uh, of the taxes still, uh, sorry, a district resident only pays 88% of the bill uh, for their 80, 88 cents per dollar of services that they receive. But the heavy industry actually pays about $13 for every dollar of services that they receive from the municipality. So we do actually already have a system that is uh, making it that uh, so that uh, light industrial, industrial and commercial properties are already contributing more than they're receiving back in services. One of the challenges of attracting new businesses, especially industrial businesses to the North Shore, is simply the cost of light industrial space. The rents and especially a triple net leases on those space are punishing, especially for the smaller uh, industrial operators, whether that's a, a manufacturing business or a contractor looking for a small space. The North Shore does simply not have enough small 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 square foot uh, opportunities for small business to operate. And the businesses that are successful here don't have an opportunity to grow. And so we do need to continue to look at uh, intensity of those lands, improving those lands so that the businesses that come here can stay here and the businesses that are growing here can grow here and, and stay here. It's, um, sorry, I was watching, watching the light there. That's my engineering part coming out. Sorry about that. Um, uh, we do need to continue to expand the use of those lands. And uh, I think uh, Mayor, Mayor Little said, uh, said put the numbers perfectly, is that... Um, oh. Mike wishes to rebut. Yeah, and not so much a rebut. This is something we could probably both talk about for a very long period of time. Um, so the District of North Vancouver is uh, uh, through also through our partnership. Um, um, Councillor Back was one of our representatives on the Metro Vancouver Industrial Lands Task Force, and we unanimously supported the recommendations that came from that committee. And what that is, is basically that uh, uh, we're going to protect the industrial land that we have in our community. We've seen a lot of municipalities in the lower mainland that have been eroding it. They see a little bit of foreshore and think, man, we could put some condos at a high rate on it, and, and they're taking over that space. The industrial property jobs are paying uh, the wages that people can afford to live here. Someone who's a crane operator down on uh, at uh, in a rubber tire gantry down at um, uh, uh, down at Linterm uh, makes about one hundred and six to one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, so it's actually a, a, it pays wages that can actually afford to live back in our community again. So it's incredibly important for us to protect that land base, support those businesses, and make sure that we have those high yield jobs uh, that uh, uh, in, here in our community in a healthy way. Peter T. Van has a comment. I think we're there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on this subject as well, because it's something I've paid a lot of attention to. And from my business experience, I know that the property taxes on businesses can be debilitating. Uh, there's a couple of things that are hurting our, our local businesses with taxes, and they pay a huge fee. Uh, one of the dealerships I used to work for spent $250,000 a year in property tax. How'd you like to have that? Uh, and the best and highest use assessment where the OCP has painted a target on properties that are in, especially in town centers. But what happens is they effectively get taxed on the value of the density that isn't there. And it drives up uh, property taxes so much. So you probably all know of Dykoff Nursery. Well, when high density started going to Lynn Creek, the property values went through the roof and the property taxes on Dykoff Nursery got to the point where the business model to have a nursery no longer worked. So they elected to shut down, effectively retire. They got a whole chunk of change they put in the bank, but with the property taxes they had, the business model no longer worked. So they sold. The district ended up leasing them a temporary use site so the business could continue. It's not sustainable. Uh, the biggest thing we need to do is we need to take the growing tax base and stop putting it into a reserve fund and use it to dilute the taxes of residents. Harrison would like to comment. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to chime in and say quickly, I think that the um, 
income that the district is getting from property tax from businesses and industrial um, zoning is really important. And the best thing that we can do as a community is reduce the cost for business in other ways. We need to make it more attractive for businesses to come here. You talk to small business owners here, none of them would tell other small businesses to move to this community. But small businesses, when they have an opportunity to come here, they're saying no. We need to be using the re amazing resources we have. I look at especially the nature we have in this community. We should be attracting um, something like the head offices of MEC that were just built in um, Vancouver. And the way to do that is we need affordable housing for them and we need transportation for them so that their workers can get here. But we need to use the resources that we have to reduce the cost of business here, not reduce the property taxes they are paying and reduce the services we're able to provide to our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. <laughs> I have to pipe in on this issue. Um, the district um, willfully uh, rezoned industrial land within the last 10 years to uh, residential condos on Lower Lynn, um, thinking that they would be able to pick up uh, the loss of land uh, behind the old crab shack on Dollarton. That land is now in the hands of the federal government, making a decision to add a, an addition to uh, the tsleil Reserve, and the tsleil will plan that land as they see fit for their uh, community. Um, so the district um, did not look forward enough at um, part of the OCP that said protect industrial land. We did not. Um, it, the, it, the OCP also said protect older affordable rental. We did not. We rezoned it actively uh, within the last 10 years. Um, Mr. Tevan is talking about um, highest and best use, and that needs to be reformed. Uh, the Liberal government used it. The NDP criticized it, but they kept it. Dykoff was paying $250,000 a year in property taxes because their airspace parcel above their nursery was going to be eventually rezoned by council to condos and towers, and it is killing small business. And light industrial and industrial users are subsidizing our community because as the mayor points out, they pay huge amounts of taxes and they have done for years and they provide jobs for people to afford to live in this very expensive community. Land is the biggest impediment of affordability across the board everywhere. Thank you. I'm going to mix it up a bit here and I'm going to start with Jim in the middle, just so we're not going back and forth. And I'm going to ask this one. Uh, you can all kick in if you want to answer it. Provincial leadership candidate David Eby released a comprehensive housing platform. Do you agree or not that the province should have overriding powers and why? No. It's about a housing policy from the NDP government. One minute. Well, 30 seconds. No, we'll do 30 uh, seconds. Uh, 30 oh, seconds. oh <laughs> the rain. <laughs> we don't get into the details of that. Um, Your mic's not on. We, we don't yet know the full details of it. There are aspects of that I uh, certainly agree with. Uh, he, uh, David Eby is seeking gentle densification uh, in the form of uh, secondary suites and duplexes and so forth. I think that's an idea that time has come in terms of expanding uh, housing stock without changing the character of a lot of neighborhoods. I did meet with David Eby at the Union of British Columbia Municipalities meeting three weeks ago. Uh, my message to him was we need a collaborative and a cooperative approach. We need to come together on the issue of affordable rental and social housing. And I think that's what will happen. Thank you. Okay. Trey, I'm going to ask this question of you. Would you support bi-weekly garbage collection or the, we or, or the organic collection like the City of North End and District of West End? Um, I would want to have a, some studies to see if that actually is doing what it's supposed to do in those other communities. Um, if it's if it's a, if it's doing what is intended, which is getting people to reduce their food waste, then I would be in favor of it. But I would want to see some facts before we commit to it in the district. Thank you. I don't know who to pick on. Oh, oh Lisa's. Well, I was gonna. I was just gonna add to what Jim said. Can I do that? Can I go back one question? 
um, just on uh, Mr. Eby's proposal. Um, the municipality's um, biggest power is land use, land use decisions, um, zoning. That's what we do. Um, that is our power. And um, I, I believe that although uh, I know the mayor has spent some time um, talking to uh, Mr. Eby about this issue that he would like to implement throughout British Columbia, um, and it, it goes with the idea that supply and demand will somehow lower the price. And Mike Hurley, who was just acclaimed mayor in Burnaby, um, was quoted in an article that if that concept worked, Burnaby would be one of the most affordable places in the region to live, and it is quite the contrary, one of the most expensive. So for the provincial government to come in and take away the municipality's powers of zoning would basically remove us from the discussion, and when I say us, I mean all of us here in this room, and I have a big problem with that. Um, we have done um, a, a job over the years, um, you know, managing growth in this community. And it has been since um, the last 10 years where uh, the, the wholesale commodity driven um, drive to sell our community that has erupted in this very, very expensive inflation of land that, in my opinion, is causing most of our challenges. Greg Robbins has a comment. Thank you. Yeah, just back to the David Eby um, um, comment and conversation. Uh, look, the there, there comes a point where higher levels of government look down on municipalities and say, if you don't get your act together, we'll do it on your behalf. And we saw this in California. We've seen it in Japan and Oregon and other places as well. I believe it's in our best interest as residents in this neighborhood to have our to, to determine our own destiny around zoning. And our zoning bylaws are written from they come from 1965. They're over half a century old. Uh, they worked once upon upon a time, but they don't work any longer. So let's bring the power and the decision making back to us. We understand the topography. We, we know our uh, individual circumstances and traffic. And I believe that um, it, we should do this ourselves before they do it to us. Thank you. I'm going to direct this one to Clayton. Oh, certainly. Here we go. <laughs> Mike. Is number two on? There we go. Awesome. Um, so, yes, uh, I've had uh, recent meetings with both both uh, Minister Eby and uh, with Minister Cullen uh, to discuss this issue. Uh, uh, Councillor Hansen is quite correct. We don't know all the details yet. Uh, what's been suggested is that in urban areas that uh, triplex would be the minimum zoning in some of those spaces automatically um, under the provincial regulations. The immediate response from Leonard Krog, a former NDP uh, cabinet minister and mayor of Nanaimo, is the, uh, the provincial government's role really should be to incentivize incentivize what they want to bring provincial support into the communities and make it attractive for communities to be building uh, um, what what is needed. And I, I think that's a better way to approach it and still keep the local decision making um, uh, happening in our community. Uh, make it so that municipalities that uh, that are willing to uh, build that transit oriented development and compact redevelopment are rewarded for it. Um, and then you're going to see more municipalities that uh, are reorienting their development for that purpose. But uh, the decision making capability should retain, be retained at the local government level. I believe Peter was first. Yes, I, I wanted to speak as well to the same subject, uh, Mr. Eby and, and his uh, platform, where he said that he wanted to make uh, three units on any single family lot automatic approval without going to council. Uh, and there are people here tonight who believe that this is an urban municipality, just an extension of Lower Lonsdale and downtown Vancouver. Most of the people who live here moved here because it was a suburban municipality. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of people interested in maintaining it that way. I believe what you need, someone at the table to defend you against those outside forces that believe this is just like downtown. It isn't, we don't want it to be, your voices ought to matter and you need somebody who's gonna represent you and fight for you, not roll over and and say, you know, go ahead, tear it all up, cut it up. Um, it, it's not gonna work. It's not the North Vancouver that we know and love. Um, you need to be represented. Yeah. 
I think we're a little bit past when we wanted to go to the open mic, but are there people in the audience that have questions for any of the candidates? Uh, gentleman there, would you like to ask the question? Oh. I have a specific question, but I'm wondering if any of the candidates for the candidate candidates for all the questions. Oh, yeah, it's happening. <laughs> Can I just say that I attended a meeting this morning um, with Translate, an information session for candidates that some of us attended, and um, asked that very question, will there be public washrooms in FIPS? And she said, no. And it's just completely unacceptable. Anybody else? Oh, gentleman over there? Um, so I was just gonna have an issue with the when we came up with the last party about 30 seconds set. So if you get anyone to see the message, it's more particularly relevant to me. What we're going to do is we're going to do the location of the either of these staff roles and have the next question to be how long we get this and those that. I didn't quite catch all of that. Mike, could you maybe just summarize it in that sentence? Too? Um, I believe what the question was, uh, was we currently have about 36% photo turnout, which was the highest in the last election. Historically, it was closer to 25 over the past number of years. And uh, for the mayoral candidates, uh, do we have a goal of uh, increasing voter turnout and uh, possibly above 50% in the next election? Is that a correct summary of the question? One of the issues that uh, I've seen in my eight years of council is it's actually very challenging for anyone that is, is not uh, retired or has uh, a lot of extra time on their hands to actually participate in the discussions that happen at council. They happen at seven o'clock at night on a Monday night. Uh, when I am usually putting my kids to bed, uh, when, when young families and parents across this community uh, are putting their children to bed. Now, we have video and, and online tools for that. But something we need to do as a municipality is to actually get into neighborhoods, into the shopping centers, into the parks on Saturday when people are playing soccer with our staff and as counselors and meet people where they are. Uh, one of the ideas that if I'm elected mayor is we'll actually have neighborhood champions on staff that are embedded in the communities here in Parkgate, in Edgemont. So they'll get to know the local business. They'll get to know you on a personal basis and bring your issues uh, and business issues to council for uh, consideration. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh, it's a critical question fundamental to our democracy, uh, um, engaging people and getting them out and active. And uh, uh, you can't get informed consent if you don't have um, access for the community. And so uh, we will have more uh, polling stations or sorry, voting stations uh, in this election than we've had in the past. We also now are up to three advanced polling days, including two advanced polling days in uh, Parkgate, just a block from here. Um, I think that uh, beyond the election process, we've also really been actively engaging the community through COVID. One of the things we don't wanna take our foot up on the gas uh, through the COVID period was we, we started to rely on our digital services so much more. If you don't have to make the trip into District Hall, if I don't have to send the, uh, the building inspector out to take a look at something, we've all saved and it's uh, made it life a lot easier for you. And we're gonna keep pressing forward with that. And it includes what Councillor um, um, Bond was just talking about, which is what our regular council meetings. Uh, we've uh, been actively involved with uh, hybrid Zoom meetings, both staff, council, and members of the public being able to participate either in person or virtually through through that period of time. We're going we're going to we're going to keep that uh, we're going to keep that going, uh, and uh, we're doing the same thing with. Uh, uh, with uh, Metro Vancouver and TransLink trying to make sure that people feel welcome to participate. We're seeing different people come out to the council meetings uh, when we make sure that people can access it from home. They make their dinner, they're looking after their kids, but then they engage for the period of the meeting that uh, that interests them the most. And we want to keep supporting that in our community. I think it can only produce good results. Thank you. I think Clayton has a comment. Yeah, I, I just want to, I, I don't want to rebut, I just want to respond to the to the question from the audience. 
Um, I think it's a great question. I wrote a blog post uh, just a couple of days to address this, this concern that I share. Uh, you can check it out, uh, votewellwood.ca. Uh, it's up there. Um, but yeah, I think, I think voter engagement is low because citizens don't actually get a say. Yes, it's great. We should do all, all these things, uh, ideas for consulting with voters. But consultation is very different from actually having a say, getting to vote on it. So I think we should use mechanisms like referenda to actually gauge citizens' opinions on matters, like perhaps this question of, you know, should all single-family lots be able to add a, a coach house or a basement suite and not have to go through rezoning? Hey, maybe that can be a referendum question. Let's see how North Vancouverites vote. Uh, I also think uh, decentraliz decentralization of decision-making through community associations or, or some other mechanism to actually bring, you know, on a, on a weekly, monthly basis, uh, the ability of citizens to gather together and, and debate these matters will result in greater engagement when it comes to uh, district-level elections. Thank you, Clayton. Trey? Um, what I was going to say was a lot of us, a lot of us have, as candidates have been approached by elementary schools to go in and talk to young children about this process, and I, th I think it's great. But what I haven't seen is that same reach out from high schools and universities, and those are the ones who are going to be voting for in five years, four years, three years, or already are at that age. So I'd like to see the counselors reach out more to the universities and the high schools to try and educate as to what council does, as to what this municipal level of government does, and you're only going to get more turnout if people have an investment in why they should vote. Thanks. You're next, but keep it short, please. Yes, I just wanted to respond to the original question. I think right now, the district isn't doing the bare minimum of sending out a mailer to everyone in the district, saying there's an election, telling them what their closest voting place is. I've heard from residents in the district recently who got one from the city, saying where they could go vote in the city election, because the city messed that up, but they have not gotten one from the district. That should be the absolute bare minimum, is when voting day is, where you go to vote, sending that out to every resident in the district. I don't know how that isn't happening, why that isn't happening already. So uh, we need to engage youth and younger residents in this community. And one of the motions I brought forward in this term was to uh, create a youth and younger adults advisory committee. And it came out of one of the suggestions from some of the work that North Shore Community Resources has done in engaging young people in local government uh, through a, a several weeks program where they introduced them to the basics of how local government works. They, su they submitted to us a full report with a whole number of suggestions, things like child having childcare at meetings so that young parents could come and be able to participate in meetings. Um, but having a youth and younger adults advisory committee was one of those recommendations. I, uh, I don't know where that's gone. Unfortunately, we have something called an advisory oversight committee that tends to decide which new committees are formed. Uh, and they, their conclusion was that there was no need for such a, a youth and a, a younger adults advisory committee. But I still think it's a good idea. Anyone else with a question in the audience? I'll just like here. I've noticed in so that we have a big problem in making the public watching. However, the question I think remains that the meeting is the Okay, I think you've made your point. I think sure. that they, it's not, there's no question there. You're just asking them to consider that. I'm, just, I'm assuming. Okay, anybody else? Gentleman in the red shirt. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of that will uh, for internal trains, but I also work on the other side of the Dublin Marine and driving home or preferably riding my bike for 10 hours in that construction time and I'm stuck in traffic. Coming back across the North Shore, 
and dealing with second or third traffic, but I'm not taking second or third. Uh, I know there's been uh, comments from people coming up here saying, oh, yes, we should be uh, building a, a big bridge with 10 lanes and all that. But how is that going to fix things? Or is it just going to move things, do the problem? Uh, what is the actual fix to solving a problem about commercial open and moving problems about that? So the question involves east-west traffic for local people without using the major arterials. Is that basically it? Who did you want to ask that of? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Matthew. Um, so I am a transportation engineer, and I can tell you that if you build a 10-lane bridge, it's just going to move the line up 600 meters to the front of the Cassiar Tunnel. Uh, a, a big bridge is not a solution to our traffic problems. If you're waiting in the lineup to leave the North Shore, you're waiting with everyone that works here but can no longer live here. So we need to provide housing options for people that work on the North Shore to live here as well. We need to continue uh, to make space for the rap bus that's coming to the North Shore along Marine Drive and up to Lynn Valley, while continuing to advocate strongly over the next 10 years to bring fixed link rapid transit to the North Shore. It's not a simple solution. We can't, uh, the, as the saying goes, there's always a simple uh, answer to complex problems and that answer is always wrong. Uh, it's a mix of housing and transportation and we need to commit to all of those in order to make uh, the trip in a car back across the North Shore easier for those that live here. Mike Little will answer again. Yeah, so um, one of the challenges we've had in the last 15 years is the federal government through Western Diversification Funds and through Pacific Gateway Funds has heavily invested in removing the bottlenecks uh, from almost 264th now. It's been widened almost all the way to 264th, all the way to the Cassiar connector. And then the investment stopped. And so it removed all of those roadblocks, uh, released all of that traffic to come right to our doorstop and then full stop. And so uh, it's a combination of things. It's not simply just a matter of, uh, no, we don't need a new bridge and we can just rely on transit. We also need to plan for the long-term replacement of that bridge. And when we replace that bridge, it does need to provide uh, more opportunities for expansion of uh, vehicle traffic on it. Uh, this concept of, uh, of induced demand is, is real, except that uh, what it's really reflecting is the uh, demand that is in induced by the economy. And if you have a strong, active economy, people, that is what's driving the trips to and from an area. You could build an eight-lane bridge up in Cash Creek. It doesn't mean that more people are going to travel through the eight-lane bridge. It's the economy that drives it. And the infrastructure is a resistor to that economic demand um, in the community. And so it's going to be a combination, supporting transit options in the community, and also uh, making sure that we have a long-term plan for the replacement of that key infrastructure, which has become regional infrastructure. Jim Hansen is going to comment. Thank you very much, and thank you for the question. There is one thing that's very tangibly within our powers, and that's we can stop making this bad situation worse. In one of the last major votes of our council, in a 4-3 vote with Councillor Forbes, Murray and I oppose, a 337 a parking, a, a building with 337 parking stalls was approved right at Capilano and Marine. The cars to come out and spew their exhaust in an already congested area. That's obviously just a bad transportation planning. And uh, we can just simply stop doing that. We can uh, make sure that our development doesn't uh, make these acute transportation issues worse. Lisa is going to comment. Um, thank you. When we built the OCP in 2010, we talked about sustainable communities. And uh, I always go back to my roots when I think about how to solve problems. And when I grew up in Deep Cove, as many of us in this room did, um, Deep Cove was a very sustainable little community. Um, we had a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker. Uh, we could grocery shop at Mr. Cho's or the suburban farms. We didn't have to get into a car. 
And that was really the impetus behind the OCP, creating a sustainable place like the villages in the UK, the little towns. They have all their shopping on a little street. Um, if you look at our town centers, council has been remiss in making sure that the uses for those town centers exist. Under zoning, we give a list of um, uh, uh, uses in a particular building. Um, years ago, developers used to option buildings. Now they buy them outright, um, they develop, and they keep the commercial space, and they lease it out to the highest uh, use and the highest cost. And it is pushing those little mom and pop shops that once made us sustainable out of the community, and we are still having to drive. So we have to go back and fix what the, mis the mistakes that we made before we move forward and make any more. Thank you. There was somebody over here with a question. Lady in the front. Okay, Trey first. <laughs> did, did everybody hear that? You have a good voice, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, I of course, I think it's incredibly important to keep as much green space standing as possible. The area to the north of Maplewood Bird Sanctuary is uh, basically going to be put into the tsleil Reserve. So we as a district have lost some, most of the control over what's going to happen to those lands. But what I've seen from the tsleil is that they are committed to staying with some of the plans that initially existed, which, ho which will hopefully include green corridors. Um, and the district can, for its part, improve Dollarton Highway, better bike lanes, and, and put in uh, overpasses for wildlife and pedestrians, because we're going to have a bigger highway there, more people, and so more conflict with animals on the road. So I think an overpass is what the district can do, overpasses, to make sure that um, that type of thing doesn't happen. And Lisa, you were asked to answer this question. I think from uh, when you're done, we'll go to the closing comments. Okay, thanks, Lorraine. Um, ab absolutely, I was part of uh, Group United around responsibility or re responsible development in 1996. We protected a thousand acres of forest at the base of Mount Seymour. There was 15,000 people. Um, Everybody in this room signed that petition. I know you did. And uh, and we protected that from, from development. Um, it is a migratory bird path. It runs um, from the Seymour all the way down to Maplewood mudflats. Um, the district, again, in the OCP, said that they wouldn't be looking at any um, you know brownfield development. They would be protecting our forest. Um, we have recently made a decision to take a chunk of forest at Riverside and Old Dollarton out to make way for a Metro Vancouver um, affordable housing project when we already had two serviced um, pieces of land, one in Lower Lynn and one over by um, St. Denny, where our fire training um, center is. We're moving that to the Dollarton. And uh, we could have put that project there. It's a service piece of land it's already the floodplain has already been mitigated and council made the decision to cut down a maple forest to make way for a project that could have been developed uh, much quicker and in a different area so protecting green space is absolutely um you know the core of who i am and uh, we absolutely we actually have a lot of work to do in regards to dedicating lands that we think are protected but uh, may not be so there is a there's work ahead elise and i know you're going to be right at the forefront and, and helping us get that done. Thank you. Speaking of birds, there's a service program. I, I live in at Lincoln Beach and I see the waterfowl migrating down the Lincoln Beach every spring and every fall. Has any one thought of raising awareness to all those high rises with their bright lights during migratory bird season? I, once they're built, I think it's a little hard. <laughs> anyway, there's a gentleman over there who's been wanting to ask a question. You're going to be the last one, sir. Okay.
What, what is your question, sir? That should be fairly quick, cool. Matthew. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> is that an order <laughs> i don't know uh so in the recent um release of the uh, or sorry oh. in the recent release of the deep cove uh, gallant ave Avenue uh, consultation, there's actually quite a few residents that said they wanted to keep uh, the detour. So it wasn't uh, necessarily as one-sided uh, as you might say. And my vote to, to keep the option for the detour, oh, oh, uh, keep the option for that detour open was predicated on more study in the area. We know congestion and parking and cars in that neighborhood are a big, are a big problem. And if we close off options without studying them all, that's a bad long-term decision. It's not a decision that I would support as an engineer, um, but we need to do the further study. And if that study says this detour is not helpful for any traffic in the cove, close it. If the study says, yes, there are some options that we can explore that make sense, that are gonna improve traffic and parking and access in the cove, then we should do it. I think, yeah, if you wanted to talk with Matthew afterwards, maybe that's a good idea. So I'm going to start with the closing comments, and I'm going to start with the people at the lower deck here. Start at the bottom of the top, or the top of the bottom, <laughs> starting with Mike. One minute. One minute? Okay. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out today and hearing uh, all of the candidates here. I'm uh, very excited to see the health of democracy in our community. And actually, Seymour uh, has always provided a great number of people out to these all candidates meetings. And you can tell by the statistics that Seymour votes. Um, and so I want you all to uh, take advantage of the uh, advanced polls that we've provided specifically. Uh, Parkgate has uh, two advanced polls leading up to the, to the election day. Um, you've heard us all say it that the top two issues facing our community are transportation and affordable housing uh, i believe that the two are absolutely uh, connected and that uh, uh, before we uh, get more aggressive about growth or town centers or transit oriented development we need a commitment from the provincial and federal government for the long-term replacement of the iron workers memorial bridge and a commitment to fund rapid transit to the north shore that's what we need in place first that's what should uh, be the keys to power for our community telling the municipal uh, telling the provincial government government that once we have agreements in place in these fields, then we're going to play ball on redevelopment for transit oriented development in those spaces. And that happens with us aggressively uh, campaigning to the provincial government, which is what I'm already doing at this point. But uh, once again, on October 15th, uh, my name is Mike Little, and I hope I can count on your vote. Thank you very much. Matthew. Matthew Bond, please. Thank you, everyone, for coming here tonight. In the Seymour, we know it feels unsafe and unpleasant when walking or trying to cross the busy streets like Mount Seymour Parkway, Deep Cove Road, or Dollarton Highway. We'll invest in traffic calming on those streets to slow drivers and make it safe to get to the places you need to go. Our trails are busy with visitors and residents alike. We'll reduce the conflict and frustration at trailheads like Hyannis by improving access and connections to other areas like McCartney Creek Park and Northlands. Our community is aging and it's harder to find the healthcare professionals we'll need in the future. We'll initiate plans for the new renewal of Ron Andrews Rec Center to include space and choice for long-term care and health for those in our community that need it. Uh, if we choose to stay on the current path, we will get the same results or together we can rise to the challenges of our time and leave a legacy for future generations that will call North Vancouver home. It's our responsibility 
It's my top priority and you'll find me at the top of the ballot. So on October 15th, vote Bond, Matthew Bond. Your D Van, let's start at the other end. Hi there. Uh, as I said at the outset, I've spent five years applying for the job that you have the opportunity to uh, delegate to me on October 15th. Um, I've been attending all the meetings, um, learning all the issues, and uh, you have that chance. And I know very well that job is to represent you, not to govern and control you. And we've seen a little bit too much of that. And that means your life gets more expensive. Uh, in the draw, I'm actually at the bottom of the ballot. And so what I've been telling people, if you believe in grassroots democracy like I do, start at the bottom and work your way up. <laughs> uh, Peter T. Van, October 15th. Thank you. Thank you. It's Harrison's turn. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to the organizers. Everyone stuck around about, I think, half an hour over we were scheduled to go. So glad to have such great discussion. Uh, once again, my name is Harrison Johnston. Um, I'm running for North Bend District Council because the status quo in this community is not working for my generation. Young people my age are moving out of this community. I'm running because I believe that we need to truly create housing diversity and affordable housing in this community so that young families, workers, uh, students, seniors can all afford to live here. I believe that we need to improve our active and uh, public transportation, the safety and reliability of those options, so that people have a choice to get out of those cars, their cars. I believe that we do need positive change in this community, and I believe that we can achieve that, but we need to stop saying no. Um, once again, my name is Harrison Johnston. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, you do have advanced voting at Park 8. That is October 8th. That's Saturday and uh, October 10th, which is the Monday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at Park 8 Community Center. You can go vote there in advance as well as on October 15th. You can learn more about my campaign at harrisonjohnston.ca. Thank you all. Catherine, Catherine Pope. I think affordable housing and fixing the transportation problem is something we're all talking about. Um, and we're all good people. We all deeply care about our community. The problem is saying no over and over again to developments. Um, we have a government in place right now provincially that wants to try to fix the housing crisis. I support many of David Eby's ideas. I endorse his plan, uh, bringing in a flipping tax, removing strata restrictions on rentals, legalizing secondary suites, and adding density in our urban centers. These are all good ideas that will help the problem. So we just have to think with more of a progressive mind and be willing to, uh, to lead in some of these areas. And that's where I think I come in. I will be your advocate, your voice for this community on council. I'm Catherine Pope. Uh, Google, Google catherinepope.net and you'll find me. Thank you. <laughs> Jordan back, please. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you very much to the community associations for providing this opportunity once again for all of us to come and for, for you to ask your questions. And thanks, Lorraine, for once again being a, a fine moderator. Um, never an easy job. Um, I have so enjoyed being a counselor over the last four years. And like any new counselor, there was a steep learning curve in that first year. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and changed the way we do a lot of things. Uh, so it's been a very interesting term, but it's been the honor of my life to be able to serve the community that I've always lived in. Um, I uh, look at this job as looking to the future, and now I look at my two kids, and I look at my parents, and I think, what? how do we make this community continue to work better? And it does involve positive change, um, but I think we need to look at, um, you know, the types of changes that are going to make this community work even better uh, and, and well into the future. I'm someone who loves to connect with people even the people that I may disagree with, um, because I think it's in finding that common ground that you build a better community. So on October the 15th, 
I invite you to vote back for the future. Thank you. Clayton Walgood, please. So I'm running for council because I want to bring decision making closer to the level of the citizen. And I put forward a few ideas tonight on how we might do that. It could be referenda on zoning questions like whether to allow coach houses on single family lots. Uh, it could be things like empowering community associations or at least, you know, the district having a role in, in giving them greater visibility so that uh, residents know that they exist and, and look for opportunities to get involved there. Uh, it could be things like uh, letting residents decide on what type of community amenity con contributions they want developers to give. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas. If you'd like to share them with me, feel free to reach out at votewellwood.ca. Thank you. Thanks. Betty. Long time I remember. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I have really deep roots in this community and I want to continue to work for you. I have been listening to all of you. I listen when I walk around the neighborhoods and I find out what your concerns are. And I want to be your voice at the decision table again for a second term. As an accountant, I will use my training and skills to maintain and enhance our financial sustainability while balancing and prioritizing our real needs with our wants. This would include an audit of both our capital plans and our operating budget to see if they're still relevant today. In closing, I'm proud that this council has managed to develop supportive housing and many rental units by using d and lands and working with our partners. We have started changing the development mindset so that needed rental and sustainable housing projects are now being presented to the d and and I hope to see more of them come. Thank you very much, and I'm looking for your support on October 15th. Lisa Murray. Uh, my family's been here since the 1930s. My daughter, Sydney, is here tonight with me. She's fifth generation raised in this community. We need to come together and work for, for all people, understanding that we can't be everything to everyone and that we need to manage the house responsibly. Density has a place, but we have to understand the impacts of what we already have on our plate before we continue. My father taught me to give back and my mother's taught me to stand up, speak up and be heard. Please return a balanced council that listens to the community, is respectful, and understand that the district is more than constant redevelopment. We need to look after what we already have, protecting our environment, livability, and a future for our kids. I appreciate you all coming this evening. I'm open to questions afterwards, and I respectfully ask for your continued support on October 15th. Thank you. Jim Hansen. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you again uh, all for coming out and uh, uh, participating. I've enjoyed being uh, with you and amongst you today discussing, uh, tonight discussing local government issues and issues in our community. And I wanted to take a moment to thank all of my uh, fellow council candidates and the mayor candidates. I know firsthand how much work it is to uh, orchestrate a campaign like this, and it's necessary to the democratic process. So for thank you for stepping up and uh, coming out. Um, I, I would like to see a council that uh, narrows its focus, uh, comes together and find areas of agreement, puts aside areas of disagreement, recognizes the core needs of our community. And we've heard over and over what they are. They're housing that's affordable and upgrades to transportation. And I hope I can play some part if uh, I am reelected in creating that collaborative, constructive council that sets an agenda and gets it done in the next term. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Um, I've over the last weeks and months, I've been able to talk to and meet with a lot of the councillors on the stage or the ca candidates. I feel like I could work collaboratively with everyone on the stage. And I think that we're going to have debates, but those debates should be based on facts. And at the end of the debates, that we should be cordial and respectful. I think a strong council can work together to achieve great things. Over the past nine months since I decided to run, I've been meeting with members of the community from all walks of life, business leaders, nonprofits, 
you name it. And I've been door knocking for the past couple of days and going to be doing that for the next few weeks. So um, I just want to say that'll be the type of counselor I'll be open, available, and um, ready to meet with anyone who has issues that want that they need solutions for. Um, I'll be an advocate for children, youth, families, and seniors in this community, as well as the environment. Please uh, consider looking up my website, tradebell.ca, if you want to learn more or take a brochure. Thanks very much. Alison Manning, Wanowski. I really wanted to actually answer that last question about the Maplewood mudflats, but because, uh, you know, I was looking at the time and want to be conscious, so I thought I'd just throw that in with my closing statements, uh, keep it to two words, habitat restoration definitely needed there. Um, I encourage everyone to talk to me after this meeting. I know it's late, but uh, I think there was a lot of discussions, but a lot more needs to be said. It's impossible to discuss everything this community needs in in the format, but it, it you know, it's still a great format. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's just, there's, yeah. just, there's so much, so much to talk about. So anyway, my name's Ellison Mallon. You can look me up at ellisonmallon.ca or again, please come talk to me. I am willing to stay here until I work tomorrow morning if you actually want to, if you want to do that. Anyways, thank you so much. Thomas Tillich. Thank you. I've gained so much satisfaction in applying my vast education to help people visiting and settling in Canada that I thought I would broaden my scope and make my various degrees in law, business, and engineering, as well as my education in immigration and public law, available to the community while providing a hub for networking ideas, local businesses and resources, and accessing local laws and standards. I believe a community counselor's office should provide information on community events recreational facilities, recycling, sustainability, and city maintenance services with banks, health and welfare support services, affordable housing, transportation, parking, EDS station, and more to make the community run smoothly. I'm proud to have the support and endorsement of educator, families, and the small businesses owner. And I hope that by election day, I will have earned not just your vote, but also your trust and support. Thank you. Greg Robbins. Um, once again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, you know, you could be curled up with a good book or walking your dog and here we are, um, you know, exercising our democratic right to interact and to ask questions. And democracy is a delicate thing, it really is. And so, um, you know, Thank you for being here, and of course to my fellow candidates as well for stepping up. It's a real tightrope back. I, I can tell you it's not an easy thing to do, and to be dedicated to the process of the way that we are all here tonight is, is really impressive, and of course to the organizers as well. Um, I'm sure there's some good Netflix that you'd rather be watching, right? So it's, 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 it's wonderful to meet you. I've really enjoyed the opportunity. Um, my cards are out back. My phone number is there. You can call me anytime up to about 1030. And I'm looking forward to working with you. And one of the promises I did make in the North Shore News is that I will be available for weekly coffees if I were to be elected. So, you know, see you there. Like <laughs> Greg Robbins. And Herman Ma has the last word. <laughs> Thank you to all the organizers. Uh, it's a great evening. Uh, once again, my name is Herman Ma. Many local issues uh, tonight were discussed. I want to say I heard you. When council makes policy decisions, we need to ensure that it takes into account the environment, works in a respectful manner towards reconciliation, and ensures the financials make sense. Ultimately, it's about community building. It's not just about building high rises or condos or whatever. It's about community building. Through adequate public transportation improvements, we will have, we will continue to have a safe and vibrant community. The priority for this council should be mobility and getting around. I have attended most of the council meetings and workshops in the past three years. As an independent voice, I can bring fresh ideas and new energy to council. As someone running for the first time, I can and will work with the community and everyone who is elected. On October 15th, please vote for Herman Ma. Thank you. So on, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening. I found it help. I hope you found it helpful in making your voting decisions. 
Do you now know who you're going to vote for? <laughs> Candidates, I hope that you felt that your time was well spent and I wish you the best of luck on the 15th. <laughs>